High above the Indian Ocean, disaster strikes. The engine's on fire! More than 10 kilometers in the air, all four engines of a British Airways 747 stop working. Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 speed bird not... With no engines and little power, British Airways Flight 9 falls towards the ocean. Standby ignition on! The crew fight to keep their plane from crashing into the sea. What has crippled their massive jet, threatening the lives of everyone on board? June the 24th, 1982. British Airways Flight 9 cruises through the sky over Indonesia. In a few hours, the plane and all 263 people on board are scheduled to land in Perth, Australia. Phyllis Welch and her daughter are seated in cabin E at the very back of the enormous jet. How's that heroine of yours, Fanny Price, faring? Oh, she's having a tough old time at Mansfield Park. <laughs> it's a good place for me to spend a few hours. I wouldn't mind being there myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Mum, we'll get there. We had already traversed at least two time zones. We were very tired. We had flown through Bombay, through Kuala Lumpur, hadn't been able to get much sleep, if any, and it was a dark, dark, pitch black night. Ahead of Betty and Phyllis, Charles Capewell is returning home to Perth, Australia, with his two boys, Chaz and Stephen. Right, settle down, lads. Come on. It's time for a nap. Get back to your seat. No. What, do you want to sleep here? All right. It was a good flight. It was going well. Uh, leaving London, it was great. And uh, we was all eager to go home, and the two boys were eager to get back to, to Mum. I thought, well, if we'd be home in three hours, Perth, they'll be pat and we'll, we'll get in a taxi and we'll be home. While many of the passengers have been travelling for almost a day, the crew is fresh. They took control at the last stopover in Kuala Lumpur. Captain Eric Moody got his first taste of flying at the age of 16 when he took a gliding lesson. He was one of the first ever trained on the 747. Roger, check with Jakarta. Jakarta control, Speedbird 9 over Halim at level 370. Speedbird 9, Roger. First Officer Roger Greaves has been a co-pilot for more than six years. Barry Townley Freeman has been a flight engineer on these aircraft for just a little longer. I'd not flown with Eric before, uh, or Barry. Um, that was the first time we'd actually, we'd actually met on that, uh, that flight. As the jet flies over the city of Jakarta, it's cruising at more than 11,000 meters and has been in the air for an hour and a half. Captain Moody checks his weather radar. It shows smooth sailing for the next 500 kilometers. All right, Roger, it's all clear. Just keep your eyes open. I'll be back in a moment. Just got to use the loop. Back in the cabin, many of the passengers have fallen asleep. While Charles Capewell and his sons doze, an ominous haze appears above their heads. It's still legal to smoke on passenger jets in 1982. For the cabin crew, though, the smoke seems thicker than normal. Seems to be a lot of smoke out there. They begin to worry that a small fire may be smoldering somewhere on the plane. Maybe someone let up in the toilet. Let's go see if we can find it. A fire at 11,000 meters is a terrifying prospect. If there is a blaze somewhere, the crew must find it immediately. In the cockpit, the flight takes an unsettling turn. 
Barry and I were just sitting there minding the shop. Pitch dark night, of course. And then we started to get these pinpricks of light on the, on the windscreen. St. Elmo's fire? I don't think so. St. Elmo's fire is a natural phenomenon that's sometimes seen when planes fly through highly charged thunderclouds. But there aren't supposed to be any thunderclouds tonight. Anything on the radar? No. No, it's clear. I don't like the look of this. Let's get a better look out there. With the help of their landing lights, the two men are disturbed to see a thin layer of cloud surrounding their plane, even though nothing is showing up on their radar. But at 37,000 feet, the normal thing you would anticipate would be high cirrus, which is just a thin layer of cloud. I think we better get the captain back up here. I was reading in my book, and there was a slight flick of turbulence, just a slight flick. And I glanced over to the left, where I had a clear view of the port wing. And to my surprise, it was covered in a, a brilliant white shimmering light, which seemed to be clinging to the wing of the aircraft. I carried on reading, but I found that I kept reading the same paragraph over and over again and not taking in a word of it. I, I just didn't know what was happening. In the cabin, the smoke begins to thicken. Stewards have been unable to figure out where it's coming from. If there's a fire, they can't find it. Eh? All right, well, go see that the passengers are comfortable. anything odd, Mum? Seems rather smoky in here. I noticed that thick smoke was pouring into the cabin through the vents above the windows. And that was a very sobering sight. Turkish cigarettes. <laughs> an interesting thing this one piece will make 52 layers watch on mobile devices or the big screen all for free no subscription required download Veely now it smelled like a sort of a sulfuric electrical smell and I went on that flight deck expecting to hear that we had some electrical smoke somewhere on the aircraft but uh, nothing was further from the truth did it start? Or just after you stepped out? Anything on radar? No, it's clear, not a cloud. Oh my lord, look at engine four! It's lit up somehow. Captain, Captain, have a look at number one. It's the same on my side. None of the crew have ever seen anything like this before. But the light show is just the beginning. Their bizarre flight is about to take a terrifying turn for the worse. Strange lights are striking the windshield of a British Airways passenger jet heading to Perth, Australia. At the same time, the plane's engines are lit by a brilliant white glow. Look at engine four. It's lit up somehow. This uh, light show, if you like, had become more intense. In fact, we ended up sitting there with, with two sheets of brilliant white light in front of us in place of the windscreens. Inside the cabin, smoke has been growing thicker. Chief Steward Graham Skinner has been organising an intense but quiet search for fire. What's with all the smoke? There was smoke in the cabin. It got really, really hot. You were perspiring, literally 
drenched in perspiration. Um, the, the acrid smoke was at the back of your throat, up your nose, in your eyes, and you're rubbing this and your eyes were running, and it was, oh, it's a, not, not a very nice situation at all. Flight engineer Barry Townley Freeman has been checking his instruments carefully. He's smelled the smoke, but so far has no indication that there's a fire in any of the plane's systems. I can't find anything. With one mystery confronting them, they're suddenly faced with a frightening new situation. of light and I thought well, well I said oh well, you better close that because uh, we don't know what's that. Cheers. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> then I realised that you know something was dramatically wrong. There were huge flames coming out of the back of the engines. 20, some people said 40 feet long. These huge jets of sheer flame shooting out of the back of, of all the engines. Is it going to penetrate from the outside of the aircraft? Is it going to come into the cabin? Are we going to burn to death? Are we going to choke to death on the smoke? What's going to happen? What's causing it? What are they going to do about it? As fire engulfs the engines, one of them revs loudly and flames out. Engine failure, number four. Fire action, number four. Checklist powering gear, set. Thrust lever, closed. Start lever, off. Once one engine fails, you call for the drill to shut that one down. You have drills for certain things so that you don't have, uh, you don't fly together as a crew forever. Uh, you can fly with different people then and you can standardise the operations. The instruments do not indicate a fire on the plane, but the passengers can see flames erupting from the engines and stretching down the length of the 747. I could not see the engines from where I was sitting. I could only see the space behind them, but there was enough glow in that space to convince me that the aircraft was really seriously on fire. We were in trouble. They knew, that, as long as they were, they, they knew we were in bad, bad trouble. And they sort of uh, just looked at me as if to say, well, what are we doing now, Dad? If anything's going to happen, I want to be close to you. Oh, please. The cabin crew begins storing anything that's loose. They don't want dishes or bottles flying around the cabin if the plane begins to dive. Don't worry, it's just friction. If, if I was misleading them, then that, that was for a reason, because I didn't want to get up, uh, as upset as I felt. I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, and oh, this is going through my mind, and yet I'm chatting to the passengers and chatting to the crew, saying, oh, yeah, nothing to worry about. Yeah, it's just a little hiccup, you know. <laughs> the 747 is more than 10 kilometres above the ocean. Its engines appear to be burning, and peculiar smoke continues to fill the cabin. And then, the unthinkable happens. Number two, engine's gone. All right, then, begin the engine shut down. No, wait! The Volga, all four engines have failed. The other three just went out almost immediately, and that's when it begins to be a serious emergency. Those engines made a grating, rumbling sound, almost like a cement mixer. And then, gradually, the, the noise just disappeared and they became silent. A minute and a half, we've gone from four engines running normally to having none. The 747 has plenty of fuel, yet somehow all four of the jet's engines have completely stopped working. 
Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines out of 370. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. With no engine power and no idea what has crippled their plane, British Airways Flight 9 begins falling from the sky. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Now out of 360. First Officer Roger Greaves issues a mayday, but he has trouble getting his message across. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Repeat, all four engines. Now descending through flight level 350. Speedbird 9, you have lost number four engine? This idiot doesn't understand. Jakarta Control, Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Repeat, all four engines. Now descending through flight level 350. The, the air traffic control at Jakarta, unfortunately, seemed to have a slight problem in understanding Speedbird what we actually were saying. Four Only when another plane nearby relays the Mayday call engines. do controllers in Jakarta all understand. Engines. Now descending through flight level 350. Speedbird 9, all four engines out. Understood. As far as the crew knows, no 747 had ever lost power to all of its engines before. The crew has to find out why it's happening now. I think we've cocked something up. We were concerned and worried that we'd done something wrong, you know, to cause the whole thing. All three of us felt exactly the same. And, and it, was, it was a personal guilt in the sense of, what have I missed? What have I done wrong? You know, because, you know, this kind of thing doesn't happen. While not built for gliding, even without its engines, a 747 can travel forward 15 kilometers for every kilometer it drops. With no power, Flight 9 has started a long, slow fall. Some 10 kilometers above the ocean, the crew has less than half an hour before they smash into the sea. When they all stop, you go into automatic mode, obviously. We had practiced this drill on the simulator many, many times, and that's very good and, and all very well, as long as when it happens to you for real, what happens on the aeroplane is mirrored by what happens to you in the simulator, and I'm afraid that wasn't so. In the simulator, when all four engines stop, the autopilot turns off. But high above the Indian Ocean, Captain Moody sees that his autopilot is still on. We were all three confused and, and concerned that what was happening to us um, wasn't what we'd been told would happen to us. All right, begin restart drill. In the heat of the situation, they have no time to figure out why the autopilot is still on. On. Anything? Anything? No. Again. All right, then, from the top, battery, check. On. Crossfeed valves. Open. Fire switch. In. The standard restart drill takes up to three minutes to complete. Plunging from the sky, the crew has fewer than ten chances to get their engines going before they run out of time. Never on. Come on. Again, gentlemen. All right, from the top, battery. Check. On. Crossfeed valves. Open. Fire switch. In. At 10,000 meters, Captain Eric Moody decides to turn the plane back toward the closest airport, Halim, just outside Jakarta. But even that is too far away if he can't get at least some of the engines going again. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, turning left back to Halim out of 300. Speedbird 9, radar cannot see you. Squawk Alpha 7700. Air traffic control asks them to transmit the emergency transponder signal. Jakarta, Speedbird 9. We are already squawking 7700. Now the crew is flying back to an airport that can't find them on radar. Without the constant rumble of the engines, the cabin is quiet. Some of the passengers feel the plane beginning to descend. But without communication from the cockpit, they can only guess. The quietness was unbelievable, because it was sort of the aeroplane was no engines, nothing, and it seemed to be eerie, you know, a bit surreal, really, because, like, as if he was in suspended in space or something, and all I could feel was this quietness and the whimpering from a few people that were really upset.
some people for sitting quite rigidly, almost as if they hadn't noticed anything. At first it was, it was sheer fear, and then after a while it turns to acceptance. You know you're going to die. We knew we were going to die. What's going on? What's the problem? It's just a technical fault. I've been through much worse, let me tell you. Everything be fine. I think if I'd have sat down and really thought of exactly what was happening, I don't think I would have ever got up again. One steward came up to us and said, are you two ladies all right? And yes, we said we're fine, which was an absolute lie, but that's how it was. It seemed absolutely vital not to panic. Captain Moody can't restart the engines unless he can keep the plane flying between 250 and 270 knots. But the airspeed indicators aren't working. Captain, I've got 320 knots on my side. Well, I've got 270. Well, bloody hell, that's a 50 knot difference. I'll change the speed. Falling from the sky with no engine power, the crew now have no idea how fast they're going. But to have the best chance to restart the engines, Captain Moody has to have the plane flying at the right speed. So from that point onwards, Eric then varied the speed through, um, through um, a, a, just about 100 knot range, hoping that at some point or other, coincidental with us putting the fuel into the engines, that we would actually be at the right speed. To change speeds, Captain Moody turns the autopilot off. Then he slowly pulls the nose of the jet up to slow it, and then pushes it down to increase his speed. The upsetting roller coaster movement adds to the panic felt in the cabin. At one time, the aircraft developed a strange motion. It seemed to be climbing steeply and then diving down. That was the sensation we got, and the bucking action that was so violent that we felt it could break the aircraft up in the air. Pressure warning, Captain. We're at 10,000. Pressure warning? That's, that's not supposed to do that. And a warning horn went off. Now, this didn't have ever happen on the simulator in this exercise, so it was a bit of a surprise to us. As well as providing electrical power, the engines on a jumbo jet help keep the cabin pressurized. <laughs> With the engines not working, of course, the air wasn't being pumped in. So gradually, the pressure was leaking away. With all four engines gone, the pressurized air is rapidly seeping out. The thinning level of oxygen makes passengers gasp. <laughs> the crew reach for their oxygen masks. But First Officer Greaves can't get his mask to work. My oxygen mask, yeah, that was a problem I could have done without. It was stowed above my head. And when I pulled the oxygen mask down, the mask and the tube became separated. The captain must make a difficult choice. If he continues to descend slowly, it will get increasingly difficult for First Officer Greaves to breathe. I said, look, if we get down to 20,000 feet, um, quickly. We can all take our oxygen masks off and we can talk and we're back as a crew again. We had to actually increase the rate of descent to descend to a lower altitude quicker, which in the circumstances was something that we wouldn't really have chosen to, to do. So then I dived the aeroplane and got rid of about 6,000 feet in a minute. The loss of cabin pressure and the steep dive have another terrifying consequence. <laughs> The things shot down, they sort of dangled down in front of you. And I looked to see if Stephen had got his, and Chaz had pulled his out of the socket. So I made sure that Chaz got his oxygen. I've seen a few movies on uh, planes, and you know, once that happens, you know you're in serious trouble. The oxygen masks came down and we put those to our faces as, as had been described in the drill, which fortunately we had been observing at the beginning of the flight. But it seemed that the, the oxygen supply was not working. Oh, 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 oh. 
The cabin crew try to use the public address system to explain what's going on, but it's not working. Chief Steward Graham Skinner makes do with a low-tech backup. Can you hear me? We're having a small problem with the public address system. So if you would, place your mask over your mouth and nose and breathe normally. As the passengers struggle with their masks, Captain Eric Moody is running out of options. If his engines don't start soon, he'll have to turn his jet around and try landing on the open ocean. High above the Indian Ocean, the seemingly impossible has occurred. All four engines on a British Airways 747 have stopped working, and the crew has no idea why. First Officer Roger Greaves manages to fix his broken oxygen mask, but he's still frustrated by engines that won't start. All right, Barry, let's start the restart drill. Ready, set, battery, check, ah. Standby power, on, ah. anything? Come on, anything? No. All right, then, let's do it from the top. Battery, check, ah. First Stand Officer Greaves and engineer Barry Townley Freeman have actually shortened the standard restart drill. It's giving them more chances to get the engines going, but so far nothing's working. Come on, you old sod. The process that we were going through the whole time was just continuous. Uh, we, we hadn't had any success with the drill at all, um, despite all the efforts we were putting in. But it was, it was the only thing we had left to cling on to, so that's what we did. From the top again, battery, check, on. I have no idea, and I don't think any of us have, how many times we tried to restart those engines. If I say 20, I would think that's too low. If I say 50, I would think that's probably about right. As the plane falls lower and lower, Captain Moody faces a brutal choice. A mountain range cuts across the island of Java between his plane and the airport. He knows he has to be at least 3,500 metres high to clear it. But if his engines don't restart soon, they won't make it. At this rate, it will crash in a matter of minutes. It's just a question of where. Captain Moody decides if the engines don't restart soon, he'll turn back towards the ocean and try landing on the water. All right, are we getting something? It's not starting. I knew it was so difficult to land aeroplanes on the sea, even when you had everything going for you. Uh, and I thought that, uh, well, we haven't got much going for us here. I'd never done it before. Hiding his concern, Captain Moody addresses the passengers and crew. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We have a small problem. All four engines have stopped. We're doing our damnedest to get it under control. I trust you are not in too much distress. Most of the passengers expect the worst. <laughs> Ma, in trouble. Plane going down. We'll do best for the boys. We love you. Sorry, Paul. I thought we were going down, heading for the ocean, which crashed. And I thought well, if she got the note, um, you know, she knew we, we were still thinking about it. And we did whatever we could. Will we be burnt alive? Will we be choked by the smoke? Will the aircraft break up in the air and hurtle us out into space? which was my biggest fear, or will we come down in the sea and be eaten by sharks alive, or will we crash into a mountain? Let's crash into a mountain quickly and get all this over. Well, nothing. It's not starting. All right, from the top then, battery, check. On. Standby power. On. 
Finally, Captain Moody has to decide, carry on and likely crash into the mountains, or turn around and ditch into the sea. I don't know how to swim. I couldn't swim anyway, so I thought, well, you know, I'm doomed anyway. And I, I just hoped that maybe one of the passengers might uh, help the two boys to make sure that they could stay afloat. Well, anything? No. All right, then, from the top again. Godfrey. We had very few uh, chances left of starting the engines before having to turn out to, to sea again because we wouldn't have been able to clear the, the mountains on the south coast of Java. And then, as suddenly as it had stopped working, the fourth engine roars back to life. Engine four, back online. Then all of a sudden there was this sort of like somebody giving the other plane a punch from underneath. And then I realised that it might have been an engine. It was a boom. Oh, oh my God, no. The noise that a Rolls-Royce engine makes when it starts up is low rumbling noise, you know, and it was, uh, it, it was just, well, it was wonderful to hear it. A 747 can fly with one engine, but Captain Moody knows that just one engine still won't give him enough power to clear the mountains. The glass now is half full, it's not half empty. We're now in with a, a real chance, and I'll tell you what, the three of us would have dragged that aeroplane round the whole island of Java. As the plane falls past 4,000 meters, another engine coughs and comes back to life. Engine three, back online. It's followed quickly by the final two. I can't believe it. Engines one and two, both back online. <laughs> From almost certain disaster, the crippled jet is now under full power. Oh my God, my God. I realized then that we could make it back to not to Perth, but to, to, to an airport. That's all we wanted was to land on, on, on the earth and, and, you know, be part of the living again. Because while we were up there, we were dead. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, we are back in business. All four running, all four This running. time, local controllers have no trouble understanding the message. All four engines serviceable again. Confirm continuing to Halley. Affirmative, affirmative. <laughs> We say, right, let's get this thing on the ground as quickly as we can. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We seem to have overcome that problem and have managed to start all the engines. <laughs> <laughs> we are diverting to Jakarta and expect to land in about 15 minutes. Captain Moody begins climbing, putting plenty of room between his plane and the mountains below. But as he does, the strange lights that he saw when the crisis began reappear in front of the jet. Now, as soon as we got to 15,000 feet, this St. Elmo's fire started again. Now, I'm not slow, so I said, let's get out of here quickly. But before he can descend very far, the plane is stricken again. Engine two is surging. Oh, no. The whole aeroplane was shaking. It was just going bang, bang, bang. The atmosphere in the cabin was very tense and very quiet. By then, I think very few people were talking. I think there were quite a lot of prayers going up. The engines backfire violently. The captain must make another fateful decision. Begin shutdown drill. Checklist, powering gear. Off. Thrust lever. Closed. We, we were reluctant to do it, as you can probably understand, but, you know, that was it. So we were back on three engines. Now, I'm not a coward, but when you've had four engines going, no engines going, you get four going and tell me, show me any pilot that will quickly shut down that engine, because you're worried that they're all going to stop again. Jakarta, Speedbird 9, leaving 154-120. We are now on three engines. As the plane closes in on the airport, First Officer Greaves thinks the windshield is covered in moisture, making it hard to see through. 
And I said, I said to Eric, I said, it's a bit misty out there. So we turn, turned the blowers on to kind of, you know, like demisters on your car to try and, and uh, clear that. That didn't work. I used the windscreen wipers and that didn't work. Somehow the glass itself has been badly damaged. For some other reason, I looked out the edge of my windscreen and about a two inch strip down the edge on the left hand side, I could see much more clearly, but I couldn't see anything much out the front. It was, it was getting more and more opaque the nearer and nearer we got to the lights. The crew get a final unwelcome surprise. Equipment on the ground that helps them descend at the proper angle isn't working. Jakarta ADC, be advised our glide path is unserviceable. The localizer, which gives you the left and right of the runway center line, that was working, but the glide slope, which gives you the actual profile for the descent, was not working. After all the troubles they've been through, now the crew has to land their plane manually. We then continued with Eric flying the localizer and me calling out the distance and the altitude that he should be at. 300 feet, Captain. So he was then able to adjust his rate of descent to what I was telling him as far as the glide slope was concerned. 200. 150 feet, Captain. One hundred. Fifty feet. Thirty feet. landed itself, uh, it, it seemed to anyway, it kissed the earth. It was beautiful. Oh, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> Safely on the ground at Halim Airport in Jakarta, passengers celebrate the end of a harrowing ordeal. They also want to know what happened. No fire had been found, so why had smoke filled the cabin? How could all four engines have stopped at nearly the same time? What were the strange lights that surrounded the plane? In the cockpit, the flight crew are relieved, but also concerned that they might be at fault. The first thing that we did, having parked the airplane and shut it all down, um, was to then go through all the paperwork to see if there was possibly anything anywhere in it that might have given us any pre-warning of some sort of phenomenon that caused what happened to us. Every time, because it's, it's gonna come back to us. The damage to the 747 is extensive. From the outside, the crew realized that their windshield had been deeply scratched. They see bare metal showing through where the paint has somehow been stripped away and they still have no idea why any of it happened. When investigators uncover the cause of the disaster, Flight 9 changes pilot training around the world. During a calm flight to Australia, all four engines of a British Airways 747 suddenly stopped working. <laughs> After a long, terrifying descent, the crew managed to restart the engines and land. Wow, that's, that's amazing. 
They spent an excited and largely sleepless night in Jakarta before returning to Halim Airport to inspect their plane. And we went back the next day to look at it in daylight. The airplane had lost its sheen and in some places it had been sandblasted quite well uh, and all the decals and, and the paint had come off. It really was very little to see until they stripped the engine stand. The engines were manufactured by Rolls-Royce. Their investigation was led by a former engineer, Malcolm Greyburn. Three of the engines were removed in Jakarta uh, following the incident and were ferried back via cargo aircraft to London Heathrow and then transported to South Wales where the engines were in fact stripped down into piece parts and it was there that I got involved. Greyburn was stunned by what he saw. Much of the engine was badly scratched and scored. We did do a forensic analysis of the engines. And we did record it all in terms of photographic analysis and also we did a lot of laboratory analysis. Greyburn discovered the engines were choked with fine dust, pieces of rock and sand. When it was closely studied, they learned that the debris was clearly volcanic ash. Days after their harrowing flight, the passengers and crew learned that the night they were flying, there had been a major eruption of the Mount Galangung volcano, located just 160 kilometers southeast of Jakarta. Tom Casadeval is director of the US Geological Survey and has studied the Galangung volcano. Indonesia is the world's most volcanically active country. It has more than 130 historically active volcanoes, meaning volcanoes which have erupted in the last several thousand years. Galungung erupted explosively early in the 1980s. In April, May, June of 1982, the eruptions became increasingly more powerful. The eruptions were large and the damage was extensive. More than 60,000 people were evacuated from the area around the mountain. The night Flight 9 flew nearby, the volcano erupted again. As the ash cloud rose more than 15,000 meters into the night, winds pushed it to the southwest, right into the path of British Airways Flight 9. Never before had a volcanic cloud seriously affected an airplane. Could the ash really have crippled this flight? Roger, declare emergency. Mayday, 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 Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Unlike ash that you might see in a chimney or after a fire in a forest, this is not soft material at all. This is very fine, ground-up particles of solid rock and minerals. This material is very, very abrasive. It's very angular in shape. If you were to see it under a microscope, you would see very sharp angles. And so that's what caused the abrasion. In addition to sandblasting the windshield and all the leading edges of the plane, could the ash cloud explain all the other strange phenomena the passengers and crew had experienced? Remember, the aircraft is moving in close to 500 miles per hour as it's flying into that cloud. Even though it's a very fine material, it can still cause abrasion and friction on the skin of the aircraft. Because it's such a dry environment up there, that frictional electrification produces the glow that we refer to as St. Elmo's fire. The electrification also caused the interference in communication experienced by the crew. Speedbird 9, you have lost number 4 engine. Some of the volcanic ash that was sucked in and ground up by the engines was also blown into the plane. And when passengers and crew saw it swirling through the cabin, they feared the worst. You're a passenger, you're looking out the window, suddenly you start breathing this sulfurous, sulfur-laden air in the cabin. And it probably is a choking, probably a shocking uh, sensation. It's essentially a, a house of horrors type situation. While the volcanic ash caused the visible scarring, filled the plane with smoke and fouled communications, 
Could it cause the engines to flame out as well? A turbofan jet engine works by sucking in enormous amounts of air. The air is then highly pressurized by the engine's compressor. This tightly packed air is mixed with fuel and ignited. The force of this reaction propels the jet through the sky. The temperature in the combustion chamber where this ash is flowing through are around 2,000 degrees centigrade. And so the volcanic ash we know melts at about 1,300, 1,400 degrees. But when the liquid ash reached deeper into the engine, it cooled slightly, turning into a sticky molten goo. It attached itself to the engine and began choking it. We got a fundamental disturbance of the airflow in the main core of the engine, which caused the engine to backfire. And the engines flamed out, and that was the cause of the problem. Backfires occur when the engine isn't burning cleanly. The engine's on fire! There's too much fuel and not enough oxygen. Engine failure, number four. Fire action, number four. Checklist, power and gear. On Set. flight nine, the backfires were the cause of the enormous jets of flame many passengers saw behind the engines. After struggling against the choking effects of the ash cloud, the engines on board the 747 flamed out. What Greyburn found next was that a remarkable piece of chemistry saved the plane. As soon as you came out of the volcanic ash and the engines were not running, remember, so everything cooled down, it was enough for this stuff to break off and allow the engines to restart. When enough of the molten ash was gone, the engines were clear again and Townley Freeman's frantic efforts to restart them paid off. Engine four, back online. We have learned quite a bit, and we've incorporated this learning into pilot training. Pilots now, for example, know what signs to look for when they might be in an ash cloud, and those signs include the odor of sulfur in the cabin, dust accumulating in the cabin, and if you're at night, you might look out and see the frictional electrification or the St. Elmo's fire on the leading edges of the aircraft. Another important lesson learned from Flight 9 is that volcanic ash clouds do not appear on normal weather radar, which reflects water. Since the clouds are dry, they're all but invisible to radar. That knowledge has led to better communications between the geologists that study volcanoes and the international airlines that fly over them. The crew of Flight 9 was showered with awards and commendations in the months after their incredible night. I thought the airmanship displayed by this crew during this event was absolutely fantastic. The way that they managed to guide this aircraft back down to a safe landing after having been through such extreme circumstances, it was fantastic the way they recovered this aircraft. Absolutely brilliant. For everyone on board Flight 9, the terrifying plunge through the skies had a lasting impact. Betty Tutel was so struck by the events of that night that she wrote a book about the ordeal. This was an event which was unique in aviation history, and it seemed to me absolutely vital that it should be put on record, and I wondered who was going to do this. But no sooner had that thought entered my mind than I thought, I'm going to do that. Tutel would also end up marrying a man she met on the flight, James Ferguson. Charles Capewell and his two sons made it home two days after they touched down in Jakarta. 25 years later, both Chaz and Stephen still live in Perth. Our time hadn't came and that was it. From then on, I took a different view of life. When your time comes, there's nothing you can do, but you can still hope. And we out, and we got out of it. Not long after their fateful flight, Captain Eric Moody created the Galangung Gliding Club. Every member of the crew and all passengers were automatically admitted to this exclusive group. 
The survivors of British Airways Flight 9 happily stay in touch to this day. 3,000? Right here. We're not getting any oxygen. We have this terrain alarm. We are in an emergency. Modern airliners are among the most complex and reliable machines in common use. But occasionally, delays in fixing a known defect have led to disaster. This is the story of one of the most terrifying and avoidable accidents in recent history. When a 747 suffered a devastating explosion at high altitude, the crew and passengers faced an unprecedented crisis. It is also a story of how one family's grief led to a relentless investigation to uncover the full, disturbing truth. Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died, and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. And it reveals how other known problems in aircraft design have continued to go uncorrected, causing further avoidable accidents. So would I be surprised if it happened again? I would be surprised if it didn't happen again. It is a matter of time. One of the most shocking cases of a known design flaw being ignored for years would finally take its toll on a United Airlines 747 bound from Honolulu to Auckland, New Zealand. As Flight 811 prepared for takeoff, the crew were concerned with another kind of threat that had recently led to tragedy. We were in the aftermath of Lockerbie, and I had instructed the crew to be particularly aware because um, it was a through flight from Los Angeles going through to New Zealand. So um, in my pre-flight briefing, I had asked them to make sure that they checked uh, any baggage that looked suspicious or anything because uh, we wanted to be extra cautious. Flight 811 was heavily loaded. 337 passengers, packed cargo holds, and a full fuel load. The doors closed on time and the plane left the gate just before two o'clock in the morning for a routine eight-hour flight. Well, we were going to New Zealand on vacation, some place that we had really thought was interesting and somebody had told us how beautiful it was, so this was kind of a dream come true. I was seated in what's called the upper deck. I hadn't had a vacation in five years, and I took all my mileage plus points from United Airlines and I purchased a business class ticket to Auckland, New Zealand and Sydney, Australia. And I was gonna finally make that dream vacation I'd always wanted to get to uh, Australia and lay on a beach somewhere and forget about airplanes, forget about accidents and, and, and get this out of my mind for a while. On the flight deck, Captain Dave Cronin was hugely experienced, just two months short of retirement. Rotate. I flew uh, almost 35 years with United. I've got over 30,000 hours of flight time and just about everything uh, military as well as uh, civilian. My co-pilot, their first officer, was uh, Al Slater. And I've known Al at that time for probably 20 years. And uh, the second officer, Mark Thomas, was the first time I had flown with him. But uh, we got along real well. Tell him we can handle 33 if it's available. OK. The pilots wanted to climb to 33,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean to avoid turbulence from bad weather. We did notice that there were thunderstorms 100 miles south, right on course, which was rather unusual for that time of night. So I left the seatbelt sign on. 
Captain Cronin's decision to keep people fastened in their seats would save the lives of many. We were still climbing out, and the seatbelt sign was still on, and um, just basically getting ready to uh, serve beverages and then to tuck everyone in for the evening because it was going to be a long flight down to New Zealand. OK, tell them we're going to detour over to the left. Center, United 811 Heavy, we're going to be detouring. Some weather here, uh, it'll be to the left, of course. A hundred miles from Honolulu, as Flight 811 climbed through 23,000 feet, a critical malfunction was about to occur. There was now a huge air pressure difference between the inside and outside of the aircraft. Suddenly, passengers sitting just above and behind the cargo door heard a noise. Then there was kind of a grinding noise. I heard a, like a thud. What the hell? In the next nanosecond, it was pure, unadulterated pandemonium. We lost number three. We're going down. It looks like we've lost number three engine and we're descending rapidly. Coming back. The next thing I knew, I found myself on the stairwell, hanging on to the rungs, and I immediately knew it was an explosive decompression. The cargo door had torn off and ripped a huge section of the plane with it. The pressurized air inside blasted out with explosive force. I immediately thought of Lockerbie. We actually thought it was a bomb that went off. It was hell on earth. Everything on the airplane that wasn't fastened down, tied down, or secured, what became airborne. Um, the noise was incredible. Everything in front of us was gone. Where we were sitting, we were about six inches from the hole, so there was nothing in front of us or to the side of us. The whole side of the plane was gone. Actually, our feet were dangling on the hole, and uh, I first thought we, we, we weren't going to make it. You know, I just didn't think there was any hope. With the pressurized air blown out, the lack of oxygen at 23,000 feet was now suffocating the passengers and crew. It felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach, um, knocked the wind out of me, and um, I remember trying to catch my breath and couldn't. You're supposed to grab those oxygen masks and put them on, except the oxygen masks in that cabin, they were ripped out of the ceiling and they weren't, they weren't there. And um, I remember thinking to myself, this is what it feels like to suffocate. United 811 Heavy, we're doing an emergency descent. The pilots could tell from their instruments that the number three engine was failing, but they couldn't tell the full extent of the damage. Their priority was to get the plane down to a level where they could breathe normally. Put your mask on, Dave. But the pilots didn't know that the explosion had destroyed the entire oxygen supply. I can't get any oxygen. We're not getting any oxygen. You getting any? I can't get any either. With the plane heading steeply down and no word from the cockpit, the cabin crew feared the worst. I remember thinking that the cockpit, which is up in the upper deck, had probably blown off the airplane too, because as far up as we could see, there was nothing there. Now we're doing this nosedive. My, my next thought was, oh my god, we're, we're just going straight down. We're going to crash into the sea. With its airframe ruptured, severe damage to the right wing and engines, and the crew forcing it down in an emergency descent, the problems on Flight 811 had only just begun. Two minutes after suffering a devastating explosive decompression, Flight 811 was still in a steep emergency descent, passing rapidly through 15,000 feet to reach breathable air. United 811 Heavy, say your altitude now. Leaving 15. United 811 Heavy, we're out of 15.5. United 811, Roger. I think we blew a door or something. Tell a flight attendant to get prepared for an evacuation. The crew finally began to level out at a safer altitude but they now faced a barrage of problems. 
The most immediate was the disintegration of the number three engine, nearest to the explosion. We don't have any fire indications. I, I don't have anything. Okay, we lost number three. Let's shut it down, there's no M1. Yeah, okay. Ready for number three shutdown checklist. Uh, number three, before you shut down number three, the generator went off. Looks all right to try it now. Well, let's stop the vibration anyway. The old jettison procedure, main boost pumps on. Center, United 811, we need the equipment standing by. Company notified, please. Got a control problem. Roger. Center wing, left, right, valves on. Start dumping the fuel. I am dumping. One stewardess had been seriously injured by falling debris. As Laura Brentlinger helped her, the full gravity of their situation suddenly became clear. As I'm holding her in my arms, I looked up, and as I looked up, that was the first time I saw this tremendous hole on the side of the aircraft that was just a void, and seats were missing, and I immediately knew that we had lost passengers. Five rows of seats had been blown out in the decompression, killing nine passengers. On the flight deck, the crew had turned the stricken plane back to Honolulu, but with 80 miles still to go, the crisis now got far worse. We got a hell of a control problem here. I got almost full rudder on this thing. Are you dumping as fast as you can? I'm dumping everything. We got a problem with number four engine? Yeah. Debris from the explosion had also damaged the number four engine. If it failed completely, the implications were severe. If you're on two engines and you weigh 700,000 pounds, that is a big deal. Simply because with that kind of weight, Two engines are not going to keep you in the air. You're going to come down. Can you maintain 240? Yeah, just barely. We're losing altitude. No it. Center, United 811 Heavy. Do you have a fix on us? Affirmative, sir. I have you on radar. OK, uh, we've lost engine number three, and we don't have full power on engine number four. Uh, we can't hold altitude right now. Uh, we're dumping fuel, so... United 11 Heavy, Roger. I show you six zero miles south of Honolulu at this time. Uh, Roger. I haven't talked to anybody yet. I, I can't get to them. Uh, you want me to go downstairs and take a look? Yeah, let's see what's happening down there. I think I, uh, we lost a compressor, but... Can't uh, hold... Can't hold altitude. Yeah, I told him that we're Put gonna... Put some axe on there. I got takeoff power on this thing. Whatever you need, Captain. Although the number four engine was failing, the pilots pushed it, along with the remaining engines, to full power, a setting they should not be run at for more than four minutes. But the nearest land was 15 minutes away. I look out the window on the right-hand side, and I see flames, big flames. And I know what flames in the engine means. It's not good. The pilots were unaware that the number four engine was now on fire. You got 250 knots now, that's good. Uh, 7,000. Uh, yeah, oh, we're getting more rumble. Watch your heading, watch your heading. You want to go direct Honolulu. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. going to go downstairs and see what the hell is going on. Yeah. Go ahead and run down and see what's happening. I saw the flight engineer descend down the stairwell. And when I saw him, my, my relief was, oh my god, they're, they're alive. And I, there was a huge sense of relief for me. He saw the hole, turned as white as a sheet, and I screamed to him, dear God, please get us down. We've got a fire out there. Oh yeah, we got a fire in number four. Go through the procedure, shut down the engine. We're not gonna be able to hold his altitude on two. We got a fire on the right side. We're on two engines now. The whole right side, it's, it's just gone from about the one right back to a, it's just open. You're just looking outside. What do you mean? It looks like a bomb. Fuselage? Yeah, the fuselage, it's just, it's just open. Okay, it looks like we got a bomb that went off on the right side. The whole right side is gone. Yeah, from, from about the one right back to uh, anybody. 
some people have probably gone. I, I don't know. I knew that we had lost people. I didn't know how many. Uh, in fact, I didn't know until the next day how many were lost. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing when you're a captain of an airplane and you lose passengers. Lee Campbell, flying home to New Zealand, was sitting in row 10, just in front of the cargo door. I woke up with such a start because I'd seen Lee standing by the bed, just with, his, with a grey jacket over his arm and a small smile on his face. And of course, as I woke up, it faded, it wasn't there. And then we woke up in the morning, we discussed this. I said, oh, no, it was strange in the night, but it was such a vivid dream. Lee was standing there. And then the radio came on, and the first item of news is that there'd been a problem with the United aircraft. And I said, that was Lee, that's Lee's. And my blood just ran cold. I, I knew he was dead from that moment. Center, do you read? We evidently had a bomb or something. A big section of the right side of the airplane is missing. 9811 Heavy Roger. I wouldn't go any faster than I had to because that, that pull, I mean, I, I wouldn't get it over 250 knots because that's a big. Okay, what's, what's our stall speed? I wouldn't go below 240. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to make this. We didn't know that we were going to make it back. So we were actually preparing to ditch that airplane at night. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, which has never been done before. In the cabin, the crew prepared for the worst. My training kicked in and um, got up for my jump seat and started instructing the crew, um, we have to prepare the cabin, we have to, you know, prepare for a ditching, which I thought was inevitable. You're running around getting life vests on, and I do remember thinking, I'm not sure this is going to matter um, because when we hit the water, you know, um, I just imagine the plane's going to split apart. I, I knew that if we hit the water, it'd be a tantamount to hitting the ground, and there would be very few, if any, survivors. So my mind went to the things that, that meant something to me, and at that point in my life, it was my son. Believing they were going to die, one passenger took these photographs in the hope they'd be found in the wreckage and give clues to the cause of the crash. For 15 minutes, the plane steadily lost altitude. Then, at 4,000 feet, the first glimmer of hope. After an imponderable time, um, I remember one of the passengers began to point out one of the windows on the right side. And everybody looked. And we looked through this little window from wherever we were, and we could see a point of light, and another point of light, and another point. And pretty soon, you could make out a coastline. OK, I've got lights over here. OK. OK, now we're at 4. Uh, we're 21 miles out. We're in good shape. At Honolulu Airport, an emergency was declared. All other aircraft were diverted and the rescue services prepared for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner. Yeah, you want to give me some speeds? Yeah. Uh, 150 is going to be your two engine. Uh, use a 160. Left, souls on board if you have it. OK, souls on board. 160 is the minimum. Uh, stand by United 811 Heavy. I don't know how many's on board. Uh, 200 and... Uh, I don't have the paperwork in front of me here. Uh, we're too busy right now. Uh, 200 and something. Okay. Six minutes from the airport, the crew now had to slow the overweight plane for landing. But the effect of this was unknown. What's going to happen when I start coming out with flaps and landing gear? Uh, we're either going to land on the airport, in the water, or downtown Honolulu. 
Okay, we'll try 10. Okay, inboards are coming to 10. Out of the controls field. All right, so far. But the flaps were damaged and could not fully extend. This meant that Flight 811 would have to land dangerously fast. You have 811 Heavy. Do you have the airport in sight? It's over here to the right, Captain. Okay. Okay, we have the airport. United 811 Heavy. 811 is clear to land. Eight left. Equipment standing by. Wind 05012. Clear to land. Eight left. United 811 Heavy. As the unstable 747 lined up for landing, the pilots knew they would only have one attempt. But even if they got it on the runway, the nagging question remained. Would the stress of impact cause the damaged and overweight aircraft to disintegrate? Severely damaged, with an unstable airframe and losing altitude on just two engines, Flight 811 now began its final approach to Honolulu Airport. Two-engine approach. Two-engine approach. We still had no idea how far off the ground we were, if we were going to make it to Honolulu or not. But that seemed like an appropriate time if we were somewhere around land that we were probably going to try and land somewhere to um, get the passengers in their brace positions. So that's when we started yelling for them to get down in their brace positions. Every molecule in my body combined to express, get this damn airplane on the ground. Well, how are we doing on the hydraulics? Hydraulics are good. You got brakes? Normal hydraulics. So we got brakes, but uh, you're only going to have reversing on one and two. Though I thought maybe there was a chance that we were going to actually be able to attempt to land, the thought came to my mind, what happens now? Do we, on impact, do we explode? Do we fall out this huge hole? Despite dumping fuel, the aircraft was still critically overweight. But without full flaps to keep it in the air, it had to approach fast. Thousand down. The danger was that the undercarriage could shear off and the plane break up. Up and a half high. 190. 185. A little slow, a little slow, Dave. Let's blow what we want. Coming up on the glide slope. Let's try the gear. No one knew if the explosion had damaged the landing gear. I remember Laura saying to me that she didn't hear the landing gear go down. And it was loud, you know, the, it was still loud, and I didn't hear the landing gear go down. So that's another thought, maybe they can't get the landing gear down. Maybe it's not down. Got gear down, we're clear to land, and everything's taken care of as far as we know. Two hundred. One ninety five. Half a dot high. Looking, looking good. One ninety two. One ninety five. Coming off on the power. One hundred feet. Fifty feet. Center the trim. Center the trim. Thirty. Ten. Zero. We're on. Gears holding. We landed. It felt fast, 
And that was my next concern, is that we weren't going to stop at the end of the runway, that we were just going to keep going. And all of a sudden, we were slowing down, slowing down. And I, I said, oh my god, we've landed. We're, we're on, on ground. And the people started applauding. Probably the best landing I've ever made. When we uh, finally stopped on the runway, we deployed all 10 chutes and the flight attendants evacuated all of passengers. It's amazing how fast everyone went. My understanding is like less than 45 seconds, 330 people were off the airplane. We were probably 20 feet off the ground and I would have stepped out of the airplane without a slide. I, I wanted to get off so bad. Fortunately, there was a slide. I stepped into the abyss, fell into the slide, whooshed down to the, to the bottom of the thing, and then you, you, you hit feet running. The slide kind of kicked me up and flew me up into the air, and I, my thought was, oh my god, I'm going to survive this whole thing, and I'm going to get wiped out here on the evacuation, because it just really threw me. And I landed and scraped up my legs pretty badly, and landed on my feet, and it wasn't until that moment that I had the sense of, I'm here, I'm okay, I'm on the ground. When we got all our switches off, I ran through the airplane, made sure there was no one else on the airplane, came up to the door one left, and went down the slide, and I came around the front, and I saw that humongous hole in the side, and I just couldn't believe it. By the grace of God, we made it, and uh, it was a, uh, an awesome experience. I, I would never want to go through that again. It was crazy, it was wild, it was scary, all at the same time. Um, I just thought that that was the end, that we were going to die. I mean, it, it, that was my first thought, that this is the end. But for the families of the nine people who were killed, the ordeal was only beginning. Kevin and Susan Campbell's son, Lee, had been flying home. About three o'clock in the afternoon, I think they said that uh, there was no New Zealanders involved, but we just knew that, that it, it was Lee. And then about, I suppose, a quarter of an hour later, we got a phone call from Chicago and they just said that they, they regret to inform us that our son was missing, presumed dead. And I guess about another hour after that, a policeman arrived at the door and he took one look at us and he says, I can see that you've had the news. So um, it was just, just an awful, awful day. And uh, it certainly didn't get much better for a long, long time. Although Lee's body had not been recovered, the Campbells flew straight to the wrecked aircraft in Honolulu. Your initial feeling is that you want to be as close to the spot where your relative died, um, and that was the aircraft. So we had to immediately go in and see the aircraft. The damage inside was horrific, just a total mess. And the hole in the side of the aircraft was much bigger than I had thought it would be, even though we had seen television news reel reports. And it was so sad to get in and actually see where Lee's seat had been. The legs of the seat were still there. There was a good bit of fuselage beside him and still a window. But the Campbell's desire to find the cause of Lee's death inevitably brought them face to face with dreadful details. They took us to the medical examiner's office as well. Um, 
because they had found body parts and, and that sort of thing. So um, they didn't actually show us the body parts, but they showed us bits and pieces that they had recovered from the engines. And um, we got the medical examiner's report on what they had recovered. So, um, you know, we really would have preferred that it was Lee that went through the engine because it would have been an immediate death, whereas it was a four minute fall down to the ocean. And we know that the people could have been alive as they were falling. And when you think about that, that's just horrific. As it became clear that their son's body would never be found, the Campbell's need to find the cause of the accident that killed him grew stronger. Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. The Campbells embarked on a relentless personal investigation that would last nearly two years. The loss of their son meant they would stop at nothing to uncover the truth. The engines number three and four Two months after the accident on Flight 811, when the National Transportation Safety Board held preliminary hearings, the Campbells made sure they were there. But they soon grew frustrated. The NTSB would not complete its report for months, so the Campbells took matters into their own hands. We certainly weren't going to leave it to the, the NTSB to, to come up with the findings we were going to follow through. And when the hearings ended, they had said that we could take whatever we wanted off the press table. And Susan walked up to the top table and yelled out, there's a, a really good set up here. So I uh, grabbed a box and loaded in all of the, the documents that we could find up there. Kevin's the most honest of people I know, but here he was taking something that we hadn't specifically been told we could take. And we're heading out the door just as the NTSB were arriving back in with the trolley to, to pick up all their documents. So we were out the door and into a taxi and gone. So we quickly realised we'd got a really good set of papers with a lot of things that hadn't been released to the public. We were able to really start our investigation in earnest at that stage. The unpublished documents revealed a disturbing catalogue of problems with the forward cargo door, going right back to its original design. Instead of a plug door that gets jammed into its frame as the aircraft pressurises, Boeing opted for an outward opening door. This allowed for more cargo space, but was not fail-safe like the plug design. So Boeing built what they believed was a foolproof locking mechanism. What they do is they build in multiple redundancies to make sure the door is properly latched and does not open. Uh, and you, you build it in to a point of, uh, that it's extremely improbable that the door would ever open. So what went wrong on Flight 811? The Campbells soon discovered that the problem lay in the design of the locking mechanism. To lock the cargo door on the 747, electric motors rotate C-shaped latches around pins in the door frame. A handle then moves arms, known as locking sectors, over the top of the C latches to prevent them from reopening. But as early as 1975, problems were found with the locking sectors. Kevin Campbell, an engineer by training, built a model to show the weakness in the Boeing design. Initially, the, the locking sectors were made in aluminium, and in 1975, Boeing realized that they weren't strong enough, and they actually doubled up the aluminium to make it double thickness. But it still wasn't uh, strong enough and a lot of the airlines didn't even put the doublers on anyway. The weakness of the aluminium drastically increased the risk of the door accidentally opening. With the aluminium locking sectors, if the sea locks tried to backwind, open electrically, it would just push the locking sector out of the way. It just simply wasn't up to the job that it was designed for. For 20 years, 747s have been flying with this crucial weakness. The Campbells wondered what else remained to be revealed. 
They redoubled their efforts to uncover the full truth behind the accident that had killed their son. We bought a car and set off in the United States to see as many people who were involved with the accident as possible. We started at Seattle, down to Denver, across to Chicago, through to Washington, D.C., down to Kentucky, on to Miami, and back across to San Diego, back up through San Francisco, back to Seattle. And that was just one trip. The Campbells soon found that a shockingly similar incident to Flight 811 had given clear warnings of the dangers in the cargo door. In 1987, two years before Flight 811, a Pan Am 747 had been climbing out of Heathrow when it failed to pressurize at 20,000 feet. The pilots had to turn back. When they got back to Heathrow, they found that the door was hanging open an inch and a half at the bottom, and all of the locks were open. When it got to the maintenance base, they found that uh, all of the, the locking sectors were either bent or broken. Why had the sea latches turned and bent back the locking sectors? Boeing claimed that the ground crew must have mishandled the mechanism. The door had been closed manually, and what they said happened was that the guy wound the sea locks close, 98 turns of a speed wrench. He closed the outer handle and then wound it open again. And if to be in the position that they were found in when the aircraft got back, he would have had to wind them open 98 turns. And this is just, just absolutely ridiculous. But the Campbell's investigation uncovered another vital clue to why the sea latches had turned. A report by Pan Am engineers highlighted problems with the door's electrical system. It had a fault in the S2 master latch lock switch that should have turned off the power to the, uh, the door when the outer handle was closed. This was an alarming finding. When the outer handle was closed, the S2 master lock switch was meant to disconnect the power supply and stop the sea latch motors from turning. So could this have failed, allowing the motors to open the door? To find out, Boeing asked the airlines to do a simple test. Close the outer handle, then press the switch to open the door and see what happens. When they hit the switch, it actually worked. The Boeing thought, you know, this is not going to work. Um, but it actually worked. There was power to the, the door locks with the, uh, with the outer handle closed. And the lock started to move. And it started to force the locking sectors out of the way. And uh, a few days later, the airline started ringing in and saying it was damaging their planes. So Boeing stopped the test. But it meant that on those aircraft, the S2 switch had failed, which is a silent failure and all of those aircraft were, were likely to have the same problem as A11. They were just waiting for a short circuit to open the doors. The Campbells now became convinced that the accident on Flight 811 began with the failure of the S2 switch. Power remained on to the sea latch motors. All it took was a short circuit in the 20-year-old wiring, which had been found to be frayed on other aircraft, to start the motors up. The aluminium locking sectors were too weak to stop the latches turning, and the cargo door burst open. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the... After waiting a year for the NTSB report, Kevin and Susan Campbell expected it to match their theory of what had led to the accident on Flight 811. I assumed that we would have a report come out that this was an electrical malfunction and were staggered when they came out and said that the door had been mishandled. The report focused entirely on the fact that the door lock must have been mishandled by the ramp attendant. That was disappointing and we felt that they must have been at a different hearing from the one we were at. So how had the NTSB come to their conclusion? There was other evidence that we had found during our investigation of uh, improper procedures by the United Mechanics and, and ramp people. So we were convinced that there was, um, we could use the word abuse being done on the doors. The doors were sort of abused 
and weren't maintained very well, we concluded that the probable cause was mechanical. For the Campbells, the NTSB's failure to mention the electrical problems just wasn't good enough. What they said happened was the door was closed, the locks didn't fully close, they just partially closed, just hanging on the, the pins, and then they closed the outer handle. But it just simply can't happen because that part of the locking sector is, is still intact. Just simply can't happen. You can't close the outer handle unless these are in the fully locked position. It's the only way that the outer handle will close. And just closing this manually, you can't exert enough force to actually damage this part of the locking sector. All it does is just butts up against there. If the locks aren't fully closed, it just simply butts up against them and goes no further. They went back to investigating the accident on Flight 811 and soon found disturbing evidence of how it could and should have been prevented. After the Pan Am incident in 1987, it turned out that Boeing had issued a directive to the airlines on how to correct the weak aluminium locking sectors. The airworthiness directive that came out was to replace the aluminum sectors with steel sectors that could not be bent. And there were some additionally, in, some interim requirements for inspections to be performed uh, until the, what they call terminating action, the uh, steel sectors were installed. The fix was cheap and simple, but getting it done was not. The actual cost of the modification, changing these locking sectors to steel, was 2,000 US dollars per aircraft, but it took 10 hours to do it, and that's where the money was, taking the, the aircraft out of service for 10 hours. That's millions of dollars. The Campbells found that back in 1987, the Federal Aviation Administration who were meant to enforce improvements, had given the airlines 18 months to comply with the modification. Within a year, Lee Campbell and eight others would die in an avoidable accident. So why weren't the airlines forced to fix the problem sooner? If these airplanes, these large commercial airplanes, are grounded, it's an economic disaster. So what they do is they lobby in the regulatory agency in the United States, it's the FAA, um, to allow them to do the fixes over time when the airplanes are in for normal maintenance. And that way, they're not taken out of service. But when they do that, when they allow the airlines, the air carriers, and the manufacturers to fix these over time, in essence, what the FAA is doing is they're gambling with the lives of the passengers and the crew that are flying the airplanes during the time they're not fixed. After the deaths on Flight 811, the FAA instantly shortened the deadline for fixing the cargo door from 18 months to just 30 days. It was only when United had gone from one of the airlines of first resort to one of the airlines of last resort in New Zealand that they just totally out of the blue, we got a, a letter inviting us over to see them. And when we got there, they were just going to do a PR exercise on us. But uh, we just laid into them, pointed out where they'd all got it wrong. And you could see them changing during it to, to realising that we did know what we were talking about and that we'd put a lot of serious effort into it. One of them actually broke down because um, I'd never had to meet next of kin before. And it ended up with um, the Vice President of United taking us round the uh, maintenance facility and he had people running off in all directions just to get the information that we wanted, questions answered. We could go anywhere with that we wanted. And uh, we just, everything was, was laid on for us because they, they, at that stage they realised that we really did know what we were talking about. 
the pressure of the Campbell's campaign eventually began to pay off. The vital piece of evidence that could prove them right, the cargo door, still lay two miles down in the Pacific Ocean. But as articles appeared in the American press, the NTSB commissioned the US Navy to search for it. A hundred miles south of Honolulu, a deep submersible began to trawl the seabed. We went to Honolulu and uh, waited there while they had their attempts. And they finally recovered the door from 14,000 feet of water, which was the deepest recovery ever at that time. And we were phoned within an hour of it coming out of the water. But before the Campbells could see it, the door was swiftly removed to Boeing's plant in Seattle. The Campbells went in hot pursuit. We went over to Boeing and they wouldn't show it to us. So they, they reckoned that uh, the crucial pieces had gone to the NTSB. So again, we got in the car and drove across to, to Washington, D.C. We arrived at Ron Schleed's office, and Ron looks at his watch and he says, I can give you five minutes. So about three hours later, we had the, the pieces that they recovered in our hand and they acknowledge that we were definitely correct, it was an electrical malfunction, and that they said they would fix the planes, they would make sure it never happens again, but just don't hold your breath that the report will ever be changed. Even with the evidence of an electrical malfunction in their hands, the NTSB refused to change their report. Then, in June 1991, fate intervened. A four-year-old United 747 was sitting on the apron in New York when the sea latch motor started up and the door opened itself. There was no way that they could hide it any longer. They simply couldn't deny that it was an electrical malfunction that was covering it. After recovery of the door was that in fact the actual... Finally, the NTSB publicly issued a revised report that concurred with the Campbell's version. There was an inadvertent failure of either the switch or the wiring that caused an uncommanded opening of the door. It's nice that other people know that you're right and had been all along and that the support that they had given you was, you know, was vindicated. The Campbells spent thousands of dollars of their own money on their campaign. They were never interested in a financial settlement for Lee's death but they did persuade United and Boeing to set up a university scholarship in his name. I couldn't have lived with myself if we had done no investigating ourselves. It was just something we both felt we needed to do. We didn't even discuss it. We just knew that's what we would do. Yeah. But despite long and public campaigns like that of the Campbells, Critics fear that the airline industry has not learnt the lessons from Flight 811. The regulatory agencies, they have a dual charge. One is to encourage aviation, and another is aviation safety. And when they get in a position where you have economics up against air safety, they tend to err on the side of economics rather than safety. Serious accidents caused by known defects have continued to occur. In the 1990s, known problems with icing on aircraft wings caused a series of crashes. At least three planes have had fatal fires due to known dangers from flammable insulation material. And in 1996, a fully laden 747 blew itself up when known faults in the wiring are thought to have ignited flammable vapors in the fuel tanks. Inevitably, experts are skeptical about the aviation industry's record of balancing profit against prevention. We've seen the wiring problem both in United 811, which was eventually turned out to be the cause of that accident, and also in uh, TWA 800, where we had an explosion in the centerland fuel tank. This, the, the industry answer to 20 and 30 year old wiring, and when the wiring can fray, break, crack, cause a short, which can either ignite fuel, like in, in TW800, or open a cargo door, like in United 11, and what the industry says, don't touch it. Don't go in there. Don't inspect it. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to remove it, because it's so brittle, 
that if you go in there to try to fix it, you're going to do more damage than you can do good. And, and that's what I call the ostrich approach to maintenance and safety. You know, we've decided that you can have an spark of ignition in the centerline fuel tank of a large air carrier. Um, but so far, we've been lucky. We've only had one every 10 years. We've only blown up three or four airplanes. Um, you know, to go in and replace this wiring would ground all these airplanes to be astronomically expensive. You know, one airplane every 10 years, one airplane every five years, two, 300 people, cost of doing business. Cost of doing business. And, and that's a great economic analysis. And unless your mother or your child is on board one of these airplanes that happens to pay the price for their economic satisfaction. For some of the survivors of Flight 811, the cost has been heavy. Each crew member handled it differently. I know there are still two crew members that have never set foot on an aircraft again. It was very difficult for me. I was diagnosed with uh, severe post-traumatic stress disorder. You can't reason, you can't think. Making the slightest decision is, is very difficult. You're, you're just at a total loss. So it was very difficult to cope with. This is the story of one of the most tragic incidents in aviation history. Of how a jumbo jet goes berserk, plunging up and down at 7,300 meters. Of how an innocent mistake made years earlier puts over 500 lives at risk. And how investigators literally stumble on the reason behind the biggest single air crash in history. Japan Airlines Flight 123 is uncontrollable. Next. the last video ever taken of Japan Airlines Flight 123. It's late summer and millions are traveling home for a traditional Japanese holiday. Something exploded. Japan Air 123 request. The plane is only 12 minutes into its flight when terror strikes. It's out of control, plunging up and down hundreds of meters at a time. And it's headed straight into the mountains that surround Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan. On the ground, Japan Airlines staff search frantically for the cause of the problem. In Tokyo, air traffic controllers try to guide the plane to safety, while the pilots resort to desperate measures to keep the plane aloft. Tokyo, Japan, August the 12th, 1985. In most of Japan, it's the eve of Obon, when people traditionally honor their ancestors, often returning to their place of birth for family reunions. Tokyo's Haneda Airport is crowded, with thousands trying to get home. On the tarmac, jumbo jets are lining up. Air travel is so popular here that Japan Airlines has to use 747s even for its short internal flights. Tokyo Area Control handles all aircraft over central Japan, including those on their way to and from the city's two big airports, Haneda and Narita. It's six o'clock in the evening, but the rush won't be over for hours. Crowded passenger lists and busy controllers make it a typical holiday weekend. Roger, approved as you request. Cathay 456, turn right on heading 250, climb and maintain flight level 240. At Haneda Airport, Japan Airlines Flight 123 is boarding. Among the passengers is young Yumi Ochiai. She's actually a flight attendant for Japan Airlines, but today she's off duty. Yeah. 
Yumi takes a seat four rows from the back of the plane. At 6.12 in the evening, Flight 123 takes off, heading for the industrial city of Osaka, 400 kilometers to the west. It's filled almost to capacity, 509 passengers and a crew of 15. Japan Air 123, contact Tokyo departure. Roger, Japan Air 123, Air 1. Captain Masami Takahama is 49 years old and one of the airline's senior training captains. On this flight, he'll be handling the radio and keeping an eye on the first officer who's sitting in the captain's seat. Yutaka Sasaki is flying the plane. He's hoping for promotion to captain. Hiroshi Fukuda, a veteran flight engineer, is the third man on the flight deck. Tokyo departure, Japan Air 123. Passing 8, uh, 800. JAL 123's route will take it south over Enshu Bay, then southwest along the coast, until finally taking a sharp right turn to land in Osaka. The flight will take 54 minutes. Flight 123 is leaving Tokyo behind, climbing to 7,300 meters. 12 minutes into this short flight, the plane's black box shows that all is going well. Hello, pet. What's the problem? Someone wants to go to the restroom. Shall I let him? The plane's black box records a routine request from a passenger. He wants to use the bathroom before the seatbelt light is turned off. Be careful, please. An ordinary request on a routine day. Air is rushing out of the cabin. The oxygen masks drop down automatically when the air pressure falls. The explosion, the sudden loss of pressure in the cabin. There must be a hole in the aircraft. Gear door. Gear. Gear. What? Check gear. Gear. The pilot's first thought is that the landing gear doors have blown off. Squawk 77. 7700 is the emergency code. When the crew radios this code to the ground, air traffic control will know the plane is in trouble. Every plane on the controller's screen carries a label giving the plane's identity. Suddenly, the label beneath Flight 123 changes. Someone in the cockpit has keyed in the emergency signal. The plane's crew members are baffled. They know only that there's been a loud noise, some sort of explosion, a subsequent drop in cabin pressure, and a growing loss of control. Yet their instruments offer no clues to the mystery. Engines. Oh, engines okay. Ominously, right the pilots can't right get the plane to respond. It's dropping. Right turn. Right turn. Hydraulic pressure. It's dropping. The plane's flight controls are powered by hydraulic pressure. The elevator, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, and ailerons, which make it turn. On a big modern jet, all these are too heavy to operate with cables and levers. Instead, they're controlled by hydraulic fluid, which flows in pipes around the aircraft. It's the lifeblood of the plane. Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request immediate trouble. Request return back to Haneda, mover. Roger, approved as you request. Turn right to heading 090. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Nothing seems to be working. All the controls are dead. They're 7,300 meters up in the air, traveling at nearly 540 kilometers an hour and unable to control the plane. In the growing uncertainty of the situation, the pilots know they need to get down fast. The controller is puzzled. Instead of making the anticipated 180-degree turn back to the airport, the plane now veers off its course, 
but not towards Haneda. No. No. Ah, 123. Negative. 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 Please confirm that you are declaring emergency. That's right? That's affirmative. Request the nature of your emergency. Hydraulic pressure on loss. On loss. No. Look. On loss. Yes. The company. Please. Make a request to the company, please. Do you want to make a fuss? The crew seem paralyzed and don't radio the airline or answer the tower. The officials on the ground don't know that the plane has lost its hydraulic power, but their screens tell them it's flying erratically and is Let's possibly descend. out of control. Right turn, descend. Look at his altitude. Up and down, up and down. But now, on control. Put your hand into it or it'll stop. The hydraulics failure has caused a serious problem. For the last few minutes, the plane has begun flying in an alarming pattern. First, it climbs steeply, then tips over and goes into a terrifying dive of 1,200 meters, only to level off and begin to climb again. This repeats itself over and over again. The pilots cannot understand this bizarre behavior, and they are powerless to stop it. Tokyo Area Control, August the 12th, 1985. The controller receives an emergency signal from a jumbo jet that left Haneda Airport 13 minutes ago. Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request immediate trouble. Request return back to Haneda, move up. the opposite In the cabin, confusion and panic spread like wildfire. There's been an explosion, and now some passengers are gasping for air. Hydraulic pressure's dropped! The plane's precious hydraulic fluid is gone. That's why the flight controls aren't working properly. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Airline personnel are trained to take charge in a crisis, and passenger Yumi Ochiai helps out even though off duty. At Tokyo Control, the controller is now joined by his supervisor. Who's that? Jal 123. He's declared an emergency. Says it's uncontrollable. He says he wants to go back to Haneda, but his heading is all wrong. He can't seem to turn. Get him to Nagoya. That'll be the easiest. It's a straight line. The best solution would be for the plane to switch course to Nagoya Airport, which is 128 kilometers straight ahead. But they'd need to start descending immediately if they're going to land there. Right, your position, 72, 72 miles to Nagoya. Can you land at Nagoya? Negative. Request back to Haneda. It's a wrong runway. The captain wants to try to get back to Haneda. It's a large airport and ideally suited for a jumbo 747 in an emergency. But it's in the opposite direction. If he can get it down. Uh, 123, can you descend? Roger, but the black box shows that he doesn't descend. Without control of the aircraft, they can't. In the thin atmosphere at this altitude, the passengers are finding it difficult to breathe. People without oxygen masks may soon become unconscious. The situation worsens as some of the masks at the back of the plane run out of oxygen. It's been five minutes since the explosion, and a flight attendant is finally able to call the cockpit with news about what's happened to the plane. Yes, what is it? The flight attendant tells the engineer that the explosion has occurred in the rear of the plane and may have come from the baggage compartment. So, the baggage compartment now further in the rear. Listen, right now the baggage compartment right at the back has collapsed. Uh, I think we'd better descend. They need to get down quickly before the passengers become unconscious. But the captain seems to be struck by a strange paralysis. All the passengers are using their masks. Shall we descend a little? The captain does not reply. It's possible that by now he and his crew are suffering from hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. Uh, the R5 pet? 
At this altitude, the oxygen in their blood starts to fall. First, their judgment may become impaired. Eventually, they may lose consciousness. The R5 pet? Yes, I understand. Captain, the R5 massive, stop! At the R5 door, the situation is becoming critical. The oxygen supply has failed. The cabin crew have to give the passengers whiffs of oxygen from a gas bottle. Still, the captain and his crew seem to be drowning in confusion. I think we better make an emergency descent. Yes. <clears throat> Shall we use our mask too? We better. I think we better use the oxygen mask. Yes. But they don't put on their masks. No one knows why. It might be indecision or hypoxia beginning to cloud their judgment. At Japan Airlines in Tokyo, flight operations have been alerted to the emergency, but are as mystified as everyone else on the ground. All they know is that over 500 lives are at stake. It's their job to try to diagnose the problem and come up with a solution while the plane is in the air. This is Japan Air Tokyo. Tokyo Control said they received an emergency call from you. It Listen, right now the R5 door has broken. Uh, Roger, is the captain returning to Tokyo? What? Can you return to Haneda? Uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, we are making an emergency descent. Uh, we'll contact you again in a little while. Uh, keep monitoring us, please. Uh, Roger. R5 door. Could it have come off? If the door has come off, that could mean an explosive decompression of the cabin as the air rushes out. Passengers may have been sucked out kilometers above the ground. But there's a worse possibility. If the door hit the tail of the aircraft, it could have damaged it. The tail keeps the plane stable. Its rudder and elevators make the plane go up and down or side to side. If the tail is damaged, flight operations will be powerless to assist them. In Tokyo, news that a Japan Airlines jumbo jet is in trouble has leaked almost immediately. Japanese television is already breaking into regular programming with live interviews. Someone saw the crippled jet fly overhead. I knew the plane was in trouble, he is saying. It was swaying back and forth. Then it disappeared in a cloud. Flight 123's meandering route has put it in range of an American Air Force base at Yokota on the northern outskirts of Tokyo. An American controller there has overheard the conversations between the plane and Tokyo Air Traffic Control. He wants to help to offer Yokota runway for landing. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota approach. If you hear me, contact Yokota. Pilots are preoccupied and don't respond. Since they've lost all normal control of the plane, they're now testing the throttles to see what happens. They can make the plane go faster or slower. At least they have speed at their command. As they experiment, they find that if they push the throttles forward when the plane is diving, making the engines go faster, it actually makes the plane come out of the dive and brings the nose up. And if they pull back the throttles when it's climbing, slowing the engines, the nose tips and begins to dive. These actions are the opposite of what a pilot would normally do, but it seems to work, and they begin to flatten out the mad roller coaster ride. Then a second experiment. By applying more thrust to the engines on the left side of the aircraft, they manage to slowly turn the plane right in the general direction of Tokyo. Then their luck runs out. In the frantic juggling of throttles, the pilots get out of step. It drives the 747 into a frenzy. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down! Should we put the gear down? Lowering the landing gear should slow the plane down and make it more stable. Doesn't work. Should I lower the alternate? For safety, 747s employ an electrically run system, separate from the hydraulics, that can lower the landing gear in an emergency. While the engines are turning, they still have electric power. Lowering the landing gear helps stabilize the plane, 
The drag of the undercarriage has a dampening effect on the pitching motion. But it also destroys the directional control they were getting by applying more power to one side of the aircraft. Max power. Close to Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan, the plane makes an abrupt turn to the right and begins a terrifying dive. The plane is falling at 900 meters a minute, twice the normal rate of descent. We're going down. Heavy. Look at the wheel. All the way. All the way. It's all the way. Heavy. Get the gear down. Gear's down. There is no need for a belt. The plane's black box records the flight attendant still trying to calm the passengers. Japan Air, one, two, three. Uncontrollable. Right, he's going to hit the mountain. Tokyo control. Tokyo control. All station, all station except the Japan Air 123. Keep silent until further advised. Uncontrollable. Understood. Do you wish to contact? Stay with us, please. Stay with us. Just as suddenly the plane comes out of its dive. They've dropped over 3,000 meters. They're now in amongst towering mountains. But at least there's more oxygen at this altitude. The pilots have been fighting the plane for an intense 22 minutes since the explosion. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. It's uncontrollable. Terrain. Hey, mountain, come on. Terrain. Terrain. Yes. Terrain. 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 Applying maximum power in order to lift the nose is their only option. In their efforts to control the plane, they've allowed the speed to drop too much. To escape the mountain, they need maximum power to generate more speed and more lift. Passengers grasp the seriousness of the situation. Many of them prepare for the end. But increasing power to avoid the mountains has caused the plane to resume its wayward up and down motions. Having run out of options, the crew is forced to repeat the same futile procedures over and over. They've been fighting the plane for nearly 30 minutes now. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota. The air traffic controllers, Japanese and American, are desperate to help, to give Flight 123 any information or reassurance they can. Request a radar vector to Haneda. Roger, understood. Keep heading 090. But frustratingly, the plane continues heading off to the northwest, away from both Haneda Airport and Yokota Air Base. Now, with every rise and fall of the plane, they're barely above the mountain tops. Can you control the aircraft now? An ominous silence descends on area control. Japan Air 123, switch your radio frequency to 119.7. 119.7, please. They try changing radio frequency. If you can, change the frequency to 119.7. There is no reply. If you read, come up on 119.7, we are all ready. Your position, five, uh, four or five miles northwest of Haneda. In the tensions of the moment, the controller is a bit confused and mistakes the plane's distance from Haneda. Northwest of Haneda? How many miles? Yes, that is correct. On our radar, you are 55, five, five miles northwest. We are ready for your approach at any time. 
Your quota is also available for landing. Let us know your intentions. Over. At Haneda Airport, emergency services are being mobilized for the plane, wherever it can touch down. Yes, watch all. Ah, they say we're 25 miles west of Kumagaya. Suddenly, the plane goes into a steep dive, the worst yet. Stop the flap! Ah, power! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Power! The plane is falling at 5,500 meters a minute. Raise the hell! Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, can you hear me? Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, do you read? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123 is gone. At Tokyo Control, they've lost contact with a Japan Airlines jumbo jet full of passengers. An American plane flying in the area has been listening in to the drama of Flight 123 and reports seeing flames in the mountains some hundred kilometers west of Tokyo. One of the C-130 pilots later said that they even guided a rescue helicopter to the scene and American Marines stood by, ready to rappel down to the burning wreckage. But before they could do so, they were ordered to return to base. Rivalry between the various Japanese emergency forces is reported to have caused confusion and delays as the victims of the crash wait for help. During the night, the Japanese self-defense force arrives on the scene. A helicopter flown by Captain Isuzu Omori finds the crash site. The pilot radios in. Minoka Yama, Victor 107. I see something. I see flames in about 10 spots over an area of about 300 meters square. Victor 107, Minoka Yama, is there any sign of survivors? Victor 107, no signs of survivors. Visibility poor, too much smoke. Victor 107, can you land to investigate? Not a chance. It's a 45 degree slope down there. No more to put down. And there's fire everywhere. Seeing no sign of survivors and unwilling to risk a landing at night, Captain Omori returns to base. Meanwhile, a team of rescuers is on its way by road. But since they don't expect to find anyone alive, they spend the night in a village 68 kilometers from the crash site. At the crash site, the passengers of Flight 123 lie dying. The next morning, the last moments of Flight 123 start to become clear. The 747 sliced a path through the trees near the top of Mount Osutaka, one of the mountains north of Mount Fuji. The plane finally hit a ridge several hundred meters further on and exploded. The wreckage and passengers then tumbled down the steep side of the mountain. It's now 14 hours after the crash, and the Japanese Self-Defense Force rescue team arrives at the scene.
they are confronted with the worst single aircraft accident in history. They're shocked to find a survivor. It's the off-duty flight attendant, Yumi Ochiai, still hanging on to life. And she is not the only one. Rescuers find a 12-year-old girl wedged in the branches of a tree and airlift her to safety. Incredibly, two more passengers are alive, a young mother and her eight-year-old daughter. It's nothing short of a miracle. But how have these four survived? The human body is believed to be able to stand a forward deceleration of up to 25 times the force of gravity. But investigators report that from the speed at which the aircraft hit the ground, those at the front of the plane experienced a sudden stop of over a hundred Gs. The four survivors are hurried to a hospital in Fujioka city. Investigators will soon discover that all four of the surviving passengers were seated in the last seven rows. This is how they survived. In the back of the 747, the impact forces were much less. Sheer luck had protected them from the flying debris. Yumi Ochiai has a broken pelvis and a fractured arm. She tells a disturbing story of what happened as she lay on the mountain, awaiting rescue, and that many more passengers survived the crash. After the crash, I heard harsh panting and gasping noises from many people. I heard it coming from everywhere, all around me. There was a boy crying, Mother. I clearly heard a young woman saying, Come quickly. Suddenly, I heard a boy's voice, OK, I'll hang on, he said. It sounded like the voice of a boy of about school age. In the darkness, I could hear the sound of a helicopter. I couldn't see any light, but I could hear the sound, and it was quite near too. We'll be saved, I thought, and waved frantically. But the helicopter went further away. Don't go, I waved desperately. Help, but it faded. I could no longer hear the voices of the boy or the young woman. It's clear now that many died in the cold night air, waiting for rescue. The crash of this jumbo jet would normally be a strictly Japanese affair, but it sets aviation alarm bells ringing around the world. Only weeks earlier, an Air India 747 had gone down in the Atlantic, killing 329 people. Now another 520 dead. Was there something wrong with the 747, the world's biggest jet? Could there be some unknown design fault? There were some 600 747s flying worldwide. A problem with the plane would have grave consequences for aviation. Ron Schleed, a top investigator with America's National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, was assigned the case. So it was very big concern on our part uh, about whether there was a problem with the 747, an airworthiness problem. And so we had to jump on this uh, very quickly to learn what happened. At the Washington headquarters of the NTSB, the chairman was extremely concerned of the potential consequences for world aviation. He wrote a personal note to his opposite number in Japan, begging him to invite the NTSB to join the investigation as guests. During the late 70s and 80s, Ron Schleed was involved with many of the major foreign investigations for the NTSB. He's familiar with the sensitivities of working with foreign governments and heads to Tokyo, where he'll meet the rest of his team, 
representatives from Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, and an engineer from America's Federal Aviation Administration. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. Once in Japan, Schlied found that the local Japanese police had taken over the investigation and were treating it like a crime scene, diligently observing his team's every move. Everyone was, was considered suspicious. Japanese airline personnel, Boeing personnel, were considered suspicious. They weren't even allowed to go to the accident site. Schleed had to wait for two days before the Japanese authorities would allow him to visit the site. I was able to convince the Japanese to allow us to take Boeing people to the site with the stipulation that the Boeing people stick, stuck very close to us and uh, we supervised them while they were on scene. They could not operate on their own. Schleed found that to gain access to the site, the Japanese had quickly constructed helicopter landing pads. It was an amazing sight to look up at this mountain and see what looked like wreckage from an airplane at a distance, but you could not recognize any part of an airplane. There were scores of helicopters in the air landing and taking off every couple minutes. Amidst the wreckage of JAL-123, Schleed found that some families of the victims had managed to scramble to the remote mountain site on foot and build shrines to their loved ones. From above, flowers rained down on the investigators. I recall these big white, I believe they were Chinook helicopters, flying over, and uh, there were families aboard the helicopters looking at the accident site. They were quite high, and they were dropping flowers, flower petals down onto the accident site. The one thing that we found uh, when we got to the accident site was that many of the passengers had a lot of time to think about the end. And uh, they found many, many notes written on pieces of paper, anything they could get their hands on. My darling wife, life with you has been wonderful. Our children have grown up to be people I am proud of. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last together. Passengers were able to think and realize that they were out of control and maybe going to crash, so they wrote notes to their loved ones and left them in the back of the seats or in their pockets. But what could have caused this disaster? Neither the heart-rending letters nor the tangled wreckage yet yield any answer to what happened to Flight 123. Still, the main thing the investigators have to go on are the words on the plane's cockpit voice recorder, those of the plane's flight engineer who had said that door R5 was broken. They believe that the door has somehow come off in flight, crashed into the tail, and damaged the plane's flying surfaces. The horizontal stabilizer, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, which controls side-to-side -side movement. But then, a piece of news that destroys that theory totally. The door had not come off. It's found by the investigators amidst the wreckage. The flight engineer was wrong. Ah, uh, right now the R5 door has broken. Uh. The warning light on his panel led him to believe that the door had failed in flight. But the alarm may well have been set off by a short circuit in the electrical system, caused by the ceiling collapsing in the explosion. It was not a broken door that caused Flight 123 to crash. The investigators would have to look elsewhere. Stop the flap! Power! 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 Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! It's up! Prisoners! 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 Priso
Japan Airlines Flight 123 has crashed into Mount Osutaka, taking hundreds of lives. Investigators are worried about a hidden fault in the Boeing 747. They need to find the cause of this crash quickly. A photograph taken by an amateur photographer provides the first clue to the mystery of why the plane became unflyable. There's something odd about the image. Photographic technicians put it on a computer and work hard to enhance the photograph to sharpen up its blurred lines. Finally, they get a clear enough picture. The whole huge tail fin of the airplane is missing. It's what keeps the plane steady. Since most of the plane's hydraulic fluid lines pass through the fin, it starts to make sense why they lost hydraulic pressure and control of the plane. Then, a Japanese Navy ship steaming across the bay south of Tokyo came upon the plane's tail fin floating on the sea. It's at the very spot where the plane had first reported an emergency. Investigators are now certain that the starting point of the accident must have something to do with the tail of the aircraft. They review the known facts. Something had caused the ceiling at the back of the plane to collapse. There had been an explosive decompression of the aircraft. Whatever it was also ripped off the tail fin and the main hydraulic lines with it, making the plane uncontrollable. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. I lost. Explosion, decompression, loss of the tail fin and hydraulic failure. The investigators need to find out what links these four elements together. Routinely, the investigators begin by looking back into the plane's history. And they make an intriguing discovery. The plane had been in another accident seven years earlier. The pilot landed the plane with its nose too high. The tail struck the ground and scraped along the runway. There had been a repair to the rear part of the airplane, including the rear pressure bulkhead. Well, all modern jets, uh, aircraft, when they climb, they have to be pressurized to keep the cabin to a reasonable level for the passengers. So let's take a 747. When the 747 is on the ground, it's actually somewhat oval-shaped. And as it climbs and pressurizes, it becomes more circular. The rear pressure bulkhead is like a huge metal umbrella lying on its side at the very back of the plane. Its purpose is to stop pressurized air escaping from the cabin out through the tail of the aircraft. It must be very, very heavy and strong because the forces are tremendous. They're over eight uh, PSI differential, very a lot of pressure. The design of a 747 aft pressure bulkhead was what they call a dome. And uh, it was uh, uh, designed to take the pressure with a lot less heavy metal. And it's a, it's a typical design. It's a pressure dome. Seven years earlier, Japan Airlines called in Boeing to repair the cracked bulkhead. Boeing engineers spliced a new panel into the damaged bulkhead. But at the accident site of Flight 123 in 1985, Ron Schleed stumbled across a piece of wreckage that unraveled the whole mystery. It was a piece of this new panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. To explain to the Japanese investigators what he discovered, Ron Schleed sketched out how the repair should have been made and the mistake that had been made. It was a catastrophic error. The rivets were carrying twice the force they should have been. One of the FA engineers there did some calculations for us based on this earlier repair of the bulkhead. And his theory was if the repair wasn't done correctly, for example, if they had not put the rivets in properly and they only had one row of rivets holding the bulkhead together versus two as designed, 
that it possibly could, it would fail prematurely. The FAA engineer calculated that the faulty repair to the bulkhead would fail after 10,000 flights. From the moment the repair was done, it was simply a matter of time. The investigators found that a simple human error had led to this. On a summer's evening in 1985, Japan Air 123 lifts off from Haneda Airport. It's the 12,319th takeoff since the repair of the damaged bulkhead, a repair that the investigators calculated would only hold for 10,000 flights. As the plane climbs to 7,300 meters, the air outside gets thinner and thinner, but the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference of pressure between the passenger cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, cracks began to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a hole in it two to three meters square, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft and simply blows it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know, and will never know, that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing blown off into the sea below along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail, and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the fugoid cycle. As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives, sometimes several hundred meters at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics and their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains and it became impossible for them to, uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle which never occurred. Lower the nose, lower the nose, yes, both hands. How about gear down, gear down, to put the gear down. To understand what the pilots were up against, Four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes, much of it among high mountains, an amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schlied had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset. Uh, uh, personally, uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. The Japanese police wanted to bring criminal charges against Boeing for its part in the tragedy, but the prosecutors decided not to go ahead. Boeing's reputation was damaged, but if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. The plane continues on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. 
However, Japan Airlines, the innocent party, had no such comfort. After I left uh, the scene and came home, it was my understanding that one of the senior Japanese Airlines uh, uh, maintenance managers actually committed suicide. The Japanese Airlines president resigned. The bookings slumped. Rumors abounded in Japan that the airline was indeed guilty and that Boeing was just taking the rap for a valuable customer. It's taken years for Japan Airlines to recover from this experience, the worst single plane crash in history. the worst that could happen on an airplane? Maybe this. There's not enough oxygen to survive up here. A freezing wind of hurricane force is roaring through the cabin. The flight crew call Mayday, but nobody hears. And the airplane is headed for a mountain. It sounds like a nightmare. For everyone aboard Aloha Airlines Flight 243, this is no nightmare. It's reality. Aloha 243, still up. When crash detectives discover what happened, their verdict shakes the airline business. This accident changed aviation history. Some people choose to trespass in that narrow space between life and death. It's a scary place to be. Surfers get there by chasing killer waves. Just occasionally, fate puts ordinary people, not just thrill-seekers, into that same deadly zone where life hangs by a thread. On the afternoon of April 28, 1988, it will happen in the sky over Hawaii. At 1 p.m., Aloha Airlines Flight 243 is preparing to depart. A Boeing 737 is on the tarmac at Hilo Airport on Hawaii's Big Island, the southernmost of the Hawaii chain. Flight 243 will be just a 35-minute hop to Honolulu on the island of Oahu. Serving the islands means that Aloha works its airplanes hard. They make short flights, but plenty of them. This airplane has been shuttling between the islands since early morning. It'll be its ninth flight today. For the flight crew, it's a routine they've followed for many years. Aloha 243. Roger. Good to speak. Captain Bob Schornsteimer has been flying for 11 years with Aloha Airlines. Roger. His Roger. first officer, Mimi Tompkins, is hoping for promotion to captain after almost nine years with Aloha. Did you hear any more about... Uh... <laughs> Each of the flight attendants has a long service record too, but none so long as Clarabel Lansing, known to everyone as just CB. Well, Mr. Kiner, welcome. Always good to see you, CB. You fixed some good weather for us. I'm smooth all the way. You bet. She's been flying for 37 years, since before the days of the first jet airliner. Let me help you with this. Oh, yeah. CB is the boss in the cabin, first flight attendant. Michelle Honda, a 14-year veteran, is number two. Jane Sato Tomita has served 19 years. This is one of the most experienced crews you'll find in an airplane that's been crisscrossing Hawaii's islands safely for 19 years. Circuit breakers. It's made more than 89,000 flights. On this day, only one other 737 in the entire world beats that record. Checked. Passengers have no reason to doubt they're in safe hands. Until one passenger, Gail Yamamoto, sees something that makes her pause. But what is it she's concerned about? And how worried should she be? Do I say something? 
Patricia Aubrey lives in Hilo, but has an appointment today in Honolulu. At first, she opts for the very front of the airplane, in row one. But somehow she feels uneasy and decides to move further back. She chooses a free seat in row 17. At 1.25, flight 243 is ready for takeoff. This airplane often rattles and shakes on takeoff and landing, but it's something the crew and regular passengers have grown used to. What's there to worry about? Though he's the captain, Bob Schornsteimer has chosen to take charge of radio links with air traffic control. It's Mimi Tompkins who'll fly the plane to Honolulu. Most of the flight time is taken up in climbing to their cruising altitude. It'll take 20 minutes to climb to 7,300 meters. For many passengers, soaring high over the Pacific is all part of the daily routine. People like salesman Howard Kitaoka in row five, he makes this trip often. When you've seen the view a hundred times, 35 minutes is precious time to catch up on paperwork. The flight's so short that the attendants serve drinks while they're still climbing. They can move around, but the passengers are still strapped in. It's 1.45. 20 minutes into the flight, the aircraft is at cruising height. Honolulu Center, Aloha 243, leveling off at 240. The crew relax. See, where's that National Weather Service weather station out here? Is that in the old tower? In perfect flying weather, everything is following the familiar pattern. I saw a brilliant flash of light and boom. Everything was going, was being sucked out of the plane. Here's what's happened. An explosive decompression has torn away 35 square meters of fuselage. We were in a tremendous blast of wind. The wind blast was unbelievable. A mass of things just went whoosh out the plane, you know, hair was up here. Everybody was in their seat, except the stewardesses. I saw the stewardess get smashed down in the, in the aisle. I could see her hair blowing and I could see blood, but I, that's all I could see of her. Jane Sato Tomita has been struck by debris at row two. Michelle Honda has been thrown to the floor at row 15. There's no sign at all of CB Lansing. I will take control power. I can't hear you. Only seconds have passed since the explosion. The wind noise makes it impossible for the flight crew to communicate. I can't hear you. Now, for the first time, they gain a sense of what's happened. Visible over a mound of tangled debris, there's blue sky where the airplane roof used to be. The first five rows are now completely exposed to the sky on both sides of the plane. The initial threat of being sucked out is passed since the airplane's now completely depressurized. But passengers are still in danger. My seatmate was flopping out outside the aircraft because at that point it was just the floor and no walls or seating. And so I grabbed him. The cold and oxygen deprivation are both potentially deadly. Just imagine the scene up there. The top of the airplane broken off. The passengers don't have any ability to get supplemental oxygen because the critical tubing that feeds that oxygen is now gone. And at 24,000 feet, with very little to breathe up there, the passengers become incapacitated. That's called hypoxia. If you stay up at that altitude for any prolonged period of time, you become more and more physically disabled. With the top of the airplane gone, you now have 300 mile an hour winds blowing into that cabin. That's three times hurricane force winds. 
Those people were dressed for Hawaii in the springtime, not minus 50 degree temperatures. Any period of time at 24,000 feet, and those people will die. High above the Pacific Ocean, an extraordinary drama is unfolding. An explosion at 7,300 meters aboard a Boeing 737 bound for the Hawaiian island of Oahu tears 35 square meters of fuselage from the airplane, exposing passengers to the sky. The cabin is depressurized with no emergency oxygen supply. Unless they rapidly reach a lower altitude where they can breathe again, the passengers will die. Captain Bob Schornsteimer takes over command of the aircraft from First Officer Mimi Tompkins. He begins an emergency descent, dropping 1,200 meters per minute, its speed now increasing to more than 500 kilometers an hour. As the aircraft hurtles down, passengers face a new terror. Wreckage blocks their view of the cockpit, and when the airplane split apart, the nose dropped down by around one meter. The plane is held together by just the narrow floor beams. The floor was buckling up, and you could tell the plane was bending in the middle. Michelle Honda can't go forward far enough to see whether the pilots are alive or dead. She tries to make contact via the intercom. Can anyone hear me? The wires are severed. As she struggles forward to try to reach the cockpit, she gets asked the one question she can't answer. Do we have a pilot? I don't know. Do we have a pilot? I do not know. Can you fly plane? The terror of those on board can only be imagined as she asks the one question no airplane passenger wants to hear. Michelle Honda was coming up and cupping her hands and yelling in everyone's ear individually, can you fly a plane? I was like, what? <laughs> you know, get out of here. Is the, is the pilot gone too? You know, because you couldn't tell if there was anybody up there. Do you know how to fly a plane? No. First Officer Mimi Tompkins tries to alert air traffic control at Honolulu. Recordings from the cockpit voice recorder, the black box, analyzed later by accident investigators, provide a dramatic record of exactly what took place. The nearest place where they can try to land is the island of Maui. Kahului Airport lies between two volcanic mountains. Between them and safety lies a 3,000 meter high summit. To fly from the location of the explosion to the safety of Kahului Airport, the pilot needs to carefully maneuver, avoiding this high ground. Can the fragile aircraft survive the stresses of turning, or if they ever reach the airport, of landing? And how can those on board survive? Jane Satotomita is barely conscious. Howard Kitaoka clutches her hand. The only faint sign of life is once when Jane squeezes back. I'm not exactly sure she was conscious, but I did manage to squeeze her hand, and she responded by squeezing my hand, and we just held hands. The simple squeeze of the hand at a time like that is very, very emotional. Mimi Tompkins is not getting through to Honolulu air traffic control, so she switches to the frequency for the tower at Maui's Kahului Airport. Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Aircraft calling tower, say again. Aloha 243. At 1.48, three minutes after the explosion, the crew make their first voice contact with the ground. Aloha 243, say your position. Persistence to the east of Makita Point. Sending out 11,000. Request clearance into Maui for landing. Request the emergency equipment. Airport fire station. We have an Aloha 737 five minutes out. 
Approximately 20 miles. Cleared to runway 02. Decompression problems. Pilot is declaring an emergency. Thank you, Mawithar. In the station, in the station. Attention in the station. We have an in-flight emergency. We have a 737, five minutes out, 20 miles. Runway two. Souls on board, fuel on board is unknown. It has deep compression problems at this time. Runway two, runway two. Aloha 243. Okay, the equipment is on the field. It's on the way. At 3,000 meters, flying west of the mountain, the pilot slows the aircraft and as gently as possible begins the right-hand turn towards Kahului. Passengers sense that someone must be in control of the aircraft. I've had some training as a pilot, and we were wings level. It wasn't in a dive or a roll. It was wings level. At that moment, I thought, we have a chance. Meanwhile, those on the ground are unsure about what kind of crisis they're facing. It's a small airport. An airliner in trouble will test the fire crew's experience. For the air controller, it's hard to hear the airplane at all. Just to verify again, you're breaking up. Your call sign is 243. Is that correct? Or 244. Aloha 243. Aloha 243. Aloha 243. Plan straight ahead for runway 02. I'll keep you advised of any wind change. Four minutes after the explosion. At this lower altitude, they're able to remove their oxygen masks. With their speed having dropped to a little over 380 kilometers an hour, the wind noise decreases just enough for them to hear one another. You want me to call for anything else? No. Aloha 243. Looks like we've lost a door. We have a hole in the left side of the aircraft. But the tower can't hear this new information. They've lost contact with the aircraft. Their transmissions aren't being picked up. Aloha 243. You still up? Is this a radio malfunction or something worse? Aloha 243. Hearing nothing from the stricken aircraft, the controller fears the worst. Aloha 243. Aloha 243, still up. Aloha 243, if you still hear, please identify. Affirmative. Aloha 243, Roger. I got your ident straight away. Cleared to land wind 040 at 20 knots. Communication is restored but the crew's ordeal is far from over. Cabot, do you hear? Now Mimi Tompkins tries to contact the cabin by intercom, but there's no response. Well, the crew doesn't really know what's going on behind them. The airplane is still flying. The captain now has to maintain his focus on flying that airplane, but he doesn't know what real damage exists behind him. Helen will need assistance to evacuate. Right, Maui Tower, Aloha 243. Can you hear me on tower frequency? Aloha 243, I hear you loud and clear. Go ahead. We're going to need assistance. We can't communicate with the flight attendants. We'll need assistance with the passengers when we land. OK, you're going to need an ambulance. Is that correct? Affirmative. During the descent, passengers experience moments of pure terror. The plane kept vibrating and shaking and the luggage racks were falling in and there was electrical wires flying around zapping and uh, you know pretty much pandemonium but it looked like the plane was ripping in half and suddenly there's a new problem for the flight crew to handle the flight manual reversion what the flight control feel like manual reversion it feels to the pilot as though hydraulic systems, like power steering in an automobile, have now failed. The airframe is under great stress. They need to land as soon as possible. Can we maintain altitude OK? There are so many thoughts that go through your head. Like one of my thoughts was, uh, man, don't put this thing in the water. I mean, you have people around you are hurt, unconscious. 
I didn't want to have to say, well, I'm gonna try to save this guy first and that guy first, but I, and don't put it on the water. The crew fear that critical wiring and control cables may have been severed. Have any of the airplane's vital parts been damaged? Let's try flying with the gear down. All right, you've got it. There are lights to indicate whether or not the landing gear has safely deployed. The main undercarriage has extended as normal, but the light showing that the nose wheel has extended doesn't come on. The last thing the pilot wanted to see, especially with his airplane in the condition it was in, was that he didn't have a nose gear because when the nose touched down on the runway, it would have broken the airplane apart, therefore breaking probably the fuel tanks apart, which could lead to a very dramatic fire and explosion. A second attempt to extend the landing gear. The nose gear light is still out, but the radio link is so bad, the tower is still trying to assimilate the crisis. Aloha 243. Just to verify, you do need an ambulance, is that correct? I still don't understand, affirmative. Roger, how many do you think are injured? We have no idea. We can't communicate with the flight attendants. Okay, we'll have the ambulance on the way. There's a possibility that we won't have a nose gear. Now, Bob Schornsteimer has to make a critical decision. Should he wait for confirmation that the undercarriage is down, or land anyway? The textbook in this case would tell the pilots to overfly the airfield so that the air traffic controllers can look at the landing gear and give them a report whether it's up or down. The pilots would then have to maneuver the airplane all the way around the airfield, come in for an approach, and land. But with an airplane which might break apart at any moment, that's out of the question. Tell them we've got problems, but we're going to land anyway, even without a nose gear. So they should be aware that we don't have a nose gear indication down. Aloha 243, wind now 050. The emergency equipment is in place. OK, be advised, we have no nose gear. We are landing with no nose gear. OK, if you need any other assistance, advise. We'll need all the equipment you've got. Maui is not an ideal place to head for with the damaged airplane. The island's exposed north shore lies directly in the path of the trade winds. I've done that landing a lot of times, and that particular approach corridor is very windy because of the mountain on one side and mountain on the other. So it's a very bumpy approach. But uh, that's basically all we had. Any kind of in-flight turbulence, that would have put great stresses on the front end of the airplane. And there's a high probability that the cockpit would have separated from the rest of the fuselage. Catastrophic loss of the airplane and a loss of life. With the airfield now in sight, Bob Schornsteimer has more critical decisions to make. He begins to slow the aircraft for landing. Let's try flaps 15. An airplane's flaps are sliding panels at the back of the wings. To increase lift at low speeds, they need to be extended during takeoff and landing. Is it easier to control with the flaps up? Yeah. Put them back to five. Can you give me a V speed for a flap five landing? No two aircraft landings are the same. Pilots have to factor in many things, the wind speed and direction, passenger and fuel load, and the length of the runway before them. Do you want the flaps right down as we land? What? Do you want the flaps right down as we land? Yeah, but after we touch down. OK. A complicated formula provides the VREF, indicating the safe landing speed. Even in a crisis like this, pilots have to reach for the manual. Extending the flaps fully will help act as a brake once they touch down. But to do it earlier could stress the airframe to breaking point. What you have to remember is that the pilots weren't trained to handle a situation like this. With the top of their airplane missing, they became test pilots. The aerodynamic effects of the airplane were drastically different than they were used to. They really had to fly by the seat of their pants. Aloha 243, wind now 050 at 20. b ref 40, plus 30, flap 1 through flap 15. 20. 20. Yeah. 
Using her flight manual, the first officer makes the complicated calculation that will give their correct landing speed. Right. The safe speed for landing, taking into account the length of Kahalui's runway 2, is calculated to be 152 knots, 282 kilometers an hour. As the airplane slows, it becomes much harder to control. And so the pilot has to make another crucial call. Speeding up to keep control means he'll hit the runway faster than he should. He gambles that the higher speed landing is still the best option. Our approach speed, I felt, was hot. I mean, we were coming in hot. I don't know, don't ask me how many miles an hour it was, because I don't know. But from other landings, we were coming in fairly hot. Crash rescue teams prepare themselves for a worst case scenario. At high speed and without the nose gear, a crash landing followed by a catastrophic fuel fire now seems inevitable. Under these conditions, the lack of a nose gear could have been a death sentence for everybody aboard this aircraft. A Boeing 737 with 95 people on board has suffered an explosive decompression near the Hawaiian island of Maui. It's still airborne, but only just, with 35 square meters of fuselage missing from the Aloha plane. As they prepare for an emergency landing, warning lights indicate that the forward landing gear has not deployed. If so, the airplane will most likely crash and burn. In the 12 horrifying minutes since the explosion, some passengers are convinced they're not going to make it alive. I thought it was going to go in the water, and uh, I was eaten by sharks. And then we saw the mountain, and I didn't think we were going to make it over it. I just knew we were going to crash into that mountain. And then when we could tell, we could see the airport. And then, you know, then I burned to death because the plane blew up when we, when we hit the runway. Suddenly, the news the pilots have been praying for. The gear is down. Inform Kaolu Command, the gear is down. OK, thanks. Aloha 243, just for your information, the gear appears down. The gear appears down. Want me to go to flap 40? Help you? No, on the ground. The crew have had to make life or death decisions. In the next few seconds, they'll find out whether they're the right ones. Michelle Honda cradles her injured colleague as the critical moment approaches. Passengers comfort one another in what may be their last moments alive. A woman that was sitting next to me and her husband, he was on the other side in the next row up. And she was next to me and they were reaching their hands out and they were trying to touch fingers to say goodbye. I was, I was a really touching moment for me. It was when I really knew I was going to die because they were saying goodbye to each other. What gave me the most comfort was knowing that my wife and my kids knew what I felt. That was great comfort. I, I didn't need to tell them anything further that I love you or, you know, I worry about you because I felt that I had already said that. Though the forward undercarriage has extended, the crew still can't be certain whether it is locked in place or whether it'll collapse on landing. If it doesn't hold firm, 40,000 kilos of airplane traveling at close to 320 kilometers an hour will smash nose down onto the tarmac. Aloha 243, just shut it down where you are. Okay. Everything's fine. The gear did it. The fire trucks are on the way. Okay. Shut it down.
In this extraordinary video, captured moments after landing, the amount of damage the airplane suffered is difficult to comprehend. An emergency evacuation of passengers who escaped injury has just been completed. Some injured passengers have still to be helped from the plane. How it flew for those 13 terrifying minutes seems astonishing. Captain Bob Schornsteimer is thanked by passengers who just minutes before had expected to die. The tension is released. Boy, I said, yes, baby. That's all I said. Pilot did a tremendous job. Patricia Aubrey hugs her heroine, Michelle Honda. I was crying. And of course, everybody was traumatized, looking at the plane and looking at the people bleeding. And just, I kept touching myself, going, I'm, I'm here. I can't believe I'm still alive. Her last minute impulse to switch seats saves her from injury, maybe from death. Something was telling me not to sit there because I didn't have a good reason to move, you know. My guardian angel was tapping me on the shoulder and telling me to move. A final desperate headcount by Michelle Honda confirms the crew's worst fears. CB Lansing, the veteran of 37 years flying for this airline, is missing. A sea search begins in the area of ocean where the explosion took place. Neither body nor wreckage are found. Jane Sato Tomita has started to recover. Seven passengers are seriously hurt, the worst injury, a skull fracture. But how have the rest survived? At the moment of decompression, it's just their seatbelts which made the difference between life and death. They went poof, a loud noise, and it just, uh, the whole thing come apart. And uh, I personally thought we were all gone, and we were uh, faster, all had our seatbelts fastened, but well, most of us evidently are would have lost a lot more. But there's something else. At the most critical moment, Maui's notorious high winds died away. I was amazed to see in front of the fuselage missing. What was so funny about the whole thing is that when it came in, it had no wind. I, mean, I believe if you did have that wind, the aircraft wouldn't have made it. It would have split in two, two pieces. And it's a miracle. It's very much a miracle. This is one of the most remarkable flying events in history. No airplane has ever landed with this amount of damage. The only thing that was holding the forward section cockpit to the rest of the fuselage were the floor beams. Basically, they were hanging by a thread. From a close study of the fuselage, crash investigators tried to determine how the airplane structure remained in one piece. The critical factor proves to be the precise location of the explosion. The thing that saved them was that because the damage was across the top of the airplane, as the nose tried to bend down, these members through here are in tension and it kept them in line and kept them straight. So even though it was almost ready to break off, uh, the structure was still strong enough here to keep it together. If this damage had been along the bottom and the nose is trying to bend down this way, the structure would have been, this similar structure would have been in compression and it would have buckled and the nose would have certainly come off. So it was fortunate that the damage was across the top. How does the roof of a jet airliner simply blow away? The US National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, is tasked with discovering what happened. Investigators pull the airplane's records, something like an automobile service history, and suspicion falls right away on the airplane itself. The best evidence for what happened, the missing fuselage section, is now lying at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. But by carefully piecing together the clues they do have, investigators hope to solve one of the most spectacular accidents of all time. In the 38 years since its launch in 1967, more than 5,000 737s were sold. Somewhere in the world, a 737 takes off every five seconds. The accident airplane was number 152 of the production line, delivered in May 1969. The airplane was designed for a 20-year service life and 75,000 flights. This one had exceeded that number, though many were of short duration. Its fuselage was under constant stress because of pressurization. The fuselage of the airplane is actually breathing. It expands and contracts depending on altitude. When it's on the ground, it's in a contracted status. 
when it's at altitude, 24,000 feet, the fuselage expands. So the airplane is constantly cycling. That's pressurization. That will weaken the structure over a long period of time. And given the history of this airplane being a very high cycle airplane, that probably had something to do with weakening the structure of the fuselage. With thousands of 737s taking to the skies each day, investigators need to be certain what made this one burst apart. An Aloha Airlines Boeing 737 bursts apart in mid-air over Hawaii. After 13 extraordinary minutes in the air, it makes an emergency landing on the island of Maui. Investigators need to discover what caused this spectacular incident. In Washington, D.C., Jim Wildey is one of the NTSB team who worked the case. His expertise as a metallurgist proves crucial. I got a call about two in the morning, in the middle of the night, from my boss, and there had been an accident in Hawaii. They were putting the team together. Uh, I hopped on a plane and, and went to Hawaii. He takes samples from the remaining fuselage and back in the lab discovers something barely visible to the naked eye. Hairline cracks like this, beside the holes where rivets had been. Figuring out how those cracks came to be there means going back to basics, to the way the Boeing 737 was put together. Airplanes are built from many separate panels. Where they overlap, they're bonded together by a powerful adhesive known as epoxy. Rivets hold the panels tight together while the epoxy sets hard. On the Aloha airplane, there's telltale discoloration inside the overlapping joints. Here is the vital clue. You can see now where the dark material is the epoxy that was used to bond the two layers of the lap joint together. The white material you see here is corrosion damage of the aluminum fuselage skin. So the original intent was that the stress that's trying to pull one skin away from the other skin piece, the stresses would go through the bonding and not through the rivets. Of course, as this thing becomes disbonded, now the rivets themselves are loaded, and especially this top row of rivets, and this is the row of rivets we think that had the fatigue cracking in it that led to the eventual opening of the roof structure on the Aloha 737 airplane. The files reveal that Boeing warned airlines, including Aloha, of problems with some early 737s. If the epoxy isn't applied at exactly the right temperature, if the panels have moisture or dirt on them, the bonding can fail. In warnings and service bulletins, some issued over 15 years earlier, Boeing spells out the danger. The Hawaii climate with humid and salt-laden air helps corrosion to occur. But instead of grounding airplanes for a nose-to-tail examination, Aloha has inspectors make occasional checks, often at night, when those on duty are least alert, working under artificial light. Those tiny cracks escape detection. These cracks go unrepaired, and now you have an airplane that is a ticking time bomb. There are other problems. Boeing's service bulletins and what are called airworthiness directives issued by the Federal Aviation Administration are often difficult to understand. Airworthiness directives are very complex and read like a legal document. Aloha needed to have someone who could read that document and interpret it into plain English for the mechanics, the wrench turners. That never happened. An airplane that has been worked so hard, serviced by mechanics who don't fully understand the briefings, is a recipe for disaster. Investigators now believe they know why the airplane burst open, but they don't yet know how. I was flying back from Hawaii to Los Angeles, and while I was in the, in the air, I got a message that, uh, that we needed to interview this passenger who had apparently seen a crack as she was getting on the accident flight. You saw something as you got on this airplane which uh, you pointed out to your roommate. It's Cynthia Johnson. Yeah, Cynthia. Yeah. Uh, talk me through it. What did you see? What I saw was to the right of the door where the paint was white. Well, it was a crack. It was like not a hole exactly, but the metal on top had come away from the metal below. I was going to tell the flight attendant, you know, but they were busy and we had to take our seats. Well, yeah, I mean, you figured, you know, they know what they're doing, it's yeah. their airplane. I didn't want to make a fuss or anything. 
No, 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 absolutely. The witness saw cracking in this area, and we found fatigue cracking back in here. So this is the line where the fatigue cracking joined up. One piece came down this way and folded off, and the other piece went across the top and came off to the right side. But something still doesn't make sense. Boeing designed the 737 and other of its aircraft so that this should never happen. Every 10 inches along the airplane are what are called tear straps inside the fuselage to strengthen it. If a tear begins, it should only reach the next strap before shooting off at a 90 degree angle. Though there's a hole in the aircraft, it acts like a safety valve. The purpose of the tear strip is to confine any kind of rip or tear in the fuselage skin to a 10 inch square basically. If you allow it to propagate beyond this 10-inch square, you could then compromise larger sections of the fuselage and cause a blowout. The 10-inch square allows a controlled decompression and confines any structural damage to a very small area. So why has the safety valve failed here? The NTSB believe there were so many cracks in the fuselage that they simply joined together, running right through the tear straps. The Aloha airplane was kind of unique in a couple of ways. The way it was operated was with very short flights, so you had large numbers of these pressurization cycles, and stress was going on and off on these rivet locations. And secondly, with the disc bonding, all this stress is now going through the rivets, and that led to the linking up of these cracks and then the, the roof coming off the airplane. But is that the final answer on what happened to Flight 243? A new theory claims to shed fresh light on those dramatic events. Matt Austin is an engineer who lives in Honolulu. The story of Flight 243 both appalls and fascinates him. I uh, flew very regularly on Aloha Airlines, and I'd been on that plane about a week before it actually lost the roof. You could tell that something was loose in the airplane. It's just like when you're in an old car and you hit a bump, you can hear the rattles in it that you won't hear in a new aircraft. In this case, when the aircraft landed, uh, there would be noises and rattles you wouldn't hear on a newer aircraft. He begins his own investigation, scrutinizing the 4,000 pages of evidence and photographs gathered during the official inquiry. I am an expert in explosion dynamics and how pressure vessels explode, what causes them to explode, which way the cracks run uh, as they're coming apart. In the case of the Aloha accident, the main focus from the aeronautical industry was they were looking at it as an airplane structural failure, whereas I analyzed it from the point of view of a pressure vessel failure. As he reviews the evidence, one question keeps recurring. Why is CB Lansing sucked out of the aircraft and not her colleague Jane Satotomita? Jane was further forward than CB at the crucial moment. Jane was at row two. CB was at row five. The NTSB believes the roof separation began near row three. Passenger testimony gathered shortly after the incident suggests that CB Lansing was sucked upwards and to the left, but not forward. I was on the aisle on the right. So I look up from my magazine, I see a pair of legs go up and out on the left. Just back of first class. From where I was, if the nose was 12, this is at 11, yeah? Forensic evidence suggests another possible scenario. Michael Sweet, an ex-cop, is now a specialist in blood spatter analysis. By studying blood stains at crime scenes, he can help put a killer behind bars or free the innocent. He examines official photographs of the 737 fuselage. This is a, a large photograph of the left side of the airplane. Uh, the front would be in this location. There's a, what we suspect to be a blood stain pattern on the, uh, right beside the window uh, right here. Could this bloodstain be where C.B. Lansing's head impacted with the outside of the fuselage? The analyst believes so. 
Well, the fact that there are blood stains on the side of this airplane suggests to me that the blood source in this case was momentarily trapped when it came into contact with the side of the airplane. If the flight attendant in this case was ejected outside of a gaping hole, I would expect her to disappear almost immediately and not leave any blood stains on the side of the airplane. This analysis suggests only that she was trapped, but without explaining how or why. Matt Austin believes he has the answer. On April the 28th, 1988, a Boeing 737 owned by Aloha Airlines in Hawaii suffers an explosive decompression in midair. Amazingly, it lands safely with the loss of one crew member. Investigators blame metal fatigue due to poor maintenance. But a new and controversial theory has emerged, challenging at least part of the chain of events. What if a safety hole has opened up as it was designed to do, but directly above the flight attendant? Matt Austin believes CB Lansing is sucked into the safety hole, momentarily blocking it. All of the air that's trying to escape has no place to go, so it built up a huge pressure spike, and that's what blew the roof off the top of the airplane. What he's describing is known as a fluid hammer. In scientific terms, air is fluid, as is water. Here's a simple demonstration in a bathtub. The water is, in fact, escaping through the drain. As we move the drain plug back down toward the hole, it will immediately slam shut and create a force, which is a simple example of a fluid hammer. He believes this phenomenon, on a giant scale, caused the accident. It's very tragic, but if we don't look at the forensic evidence that's left, then we won't understand exactly what caused the explosive decompression and possibly prevent the future occurrence. The NTSB say that the fluid hammer theory is valid scientifically, but for them the evidence still points to something simpler, a virtually simultaneous failure in the airplane's many weak spots. The safety board's investigations are never really closed. Uh, we always would take into account any new information that comes out. Uh, I believe in the case of the Aloha accident, we have, uh, uh, we have not changed our probable cause and we still uh, are sticking with the probable cause as we determined back in 1988. Since the crucial physical evidence was never found, what happened on board at the precise moment of explosion will probably never be known. Aloha Airlines management took most of the blame for their poor maintenance regime. The NTSB demanded that the Federal Aviation Administration do a much better job enforcing maintenance standards. Boeing had already improved their manufacturing process to prevent the adhesive becoming so easily contaminated. What happened on Flight 243 made flying safer. Soon after, Congress passed the Aviation Safety Research Act. This accident had a very profound effect on the aviation industry and the way we look at aging airplanes, old aircraft. We changed the way we monitor how they age, the way we inspect them, and of course now how we manufacture them. We use different processes. This was a very critical accident for aviation history. Those 13 terrifying minutes also left their impact on the survivors of Flight 243. I had to go through a healing process. I took fear of flying classes and, and the old saying of you fall off a horse and you get back on it is very accurate, but it's a lot tougher to actually do it. Patricia Aubrey had to find a way of dealing with the memories also. Her way was to revisit the same piece of airspace where the terror unfolded. I would go flying with my psychologist. You go through what they call desynthesization, where you confront your fear and you just do it so many times that you can do it without having a bad reaction. Before that happened, if something bad happened to me, I'd go, I hate life. But uh, I don't hate life. I can deal with it. Bring it on. I'll, I'll take care of it. Uh, I'd much rather be alive. There's one further legacy of that fateful day. 
the ocean never did surrender the body of C.B. Lansing. Instead, a memorial garden honoring the veteran flight attendant was planted at Honolulu Airport, beneath the big Hawaiian sky where she spent the better part of her life and where it was so suddenly ended. <laughs>